Most of you probably don't know me. Uh, I work with a very small group of students from Central Asia. So just in the past four years, we had students who got admitted to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Stanford, and Abu Dhabi, Colby, and so on. I am from Samarkand, born and raised, mm -hmm. lived there for all of my life before I moved to mm -hmm. Singapore. That's a question I have for you. Do you think mm -hmm. there's score inflation on the SATs? It is the mm -hmm. case. So here's my take on uh, the fact that everyone is getting an eye in these days. Like instead, I'd like to think that just people are just stepping up their game. People are just getting better. Just Do you think they're getting better in English mm -hmm. or you think they're getting better in test taking specifically mm -hmm. in preparing for IELTS? I got rejections from every single university except for Princeton where I got waitlisted. It's one thing to have an idea in business, another thing, know how to execute it and have a plan. And then he was literally like almost swearing at us. This it's a real United it's Nations. The United Nations. Yes, it's the United Nations. <laughs> yeah. That sounds freaking awesome. Yeah, we made a horrible mistake there. And that mistake turned out to be so successful in the end. It's really funny and it's, it's, it's a bit inappropriate actually. To hear the story, guys. <laughs> you can cut it out after. Very rarely you're given answers to things. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, it depends. You're on your own to make your own opinions from that. It's 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 a fascinating system. Yeah, my purpose is that people don't just get admitted into schools. They get admitted there and then they thrive there. Mm -hmm. They flourish with, and they know exactly what they're signing up for. You guys have parties at Yale? There's this common historical, I would say, experience of having naked parties at Yale. Mm -hmm. Yale and US and Yale, they treat students as adults. So we could literally bring people into our dorm without anyone checking who that person is. Again, back in the day, it was in Uzbekistan, there was a view that they don't admit Uzbek students from public schools. So you guys are breaking stereotypes. Some of our people in the global market, they could get paid $200 per hour, but that's factual mm -hmm. because to get the people who studied there, phenomenal English level, research skills, ability to communicate with students, delve deeper into their story, explain them how they can present their stories. It's a kind of package where you would not go into admissions if you knew that. You ever thought about the occupational hazard of being a lobbyist or an intellectual, being oh, yeah, out outspoke, outspoken and being honest and transparent about all these different issues, which sometimes might actually get you in big yeah. trouble. You, you talk with Rustam, you will talk with uh, Murad, you will talk with Parizod, you will talk with Guzal Khan, you will talk with Frangiz uh, uh, from Stanford, you will talk to a lot of these guys, you would find that there's something very deeply different about them. There is a treatment effect and there is a selection effect. Sure. Correlation between eating chocolate and Nobel Prize laureates. It's one of the classic examples from social sciences. Yeah, let's see what the internet says. They will not be making a lot of money, but they will be far most experts in whatever they study. It's much deeper than just how to make money. And how do you feel about university education being online? Because there are now a lot of actually YouTube influencers mm -hmm. with their own online universities. Yeah. I mean, recently Jordan Peterson announced that he'd be teaching online. He's much more knowledgeable than me, but it doesn't mean, and he understands academia much better than me, but nobody is proof against your own biases, your own experiences and views and your political beliefs going into your science, which I think what happened in, in his case. I think those two merged uh, where the danger lies in. Uh, Andrew Tate, I think, is, is an absolute unprecedented figure and a person who I studied and I still study as a phenomena. You're making arguments for and against at the same time. Yeah. That takes a lot of intelligence. Just I'm in awe right now. That's just a whole different level of intelligence. What's, the, what's our... Uh... Uh, three hours, a little over three hours, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Towers and ten minutes. Yeah, we, we still got some. It, it was more. very dense, though. Like, it does feel like we talked yeah. about. Do you follow UFC at all? There were some beasts there. There were people from Dagestan, like uh, mm -hmm. Dagestan champions. And if you're mm -hmm. a Dagestan champion, like, you're basically a world champion. Philosophical stand standpoint, the worst thing that can happen to you is not death, actually, it's pain. If you are, death is not. If death is, you are not. We need to, you need to unpack that. Yeah, if you exist, death does not exist. If uh -huh. death exists, then you don't exist. Yeah. So there's no point where you can actually experience death. Mm -hmm. Because when you're dead, that's it. Like, like mm -hmm. that completely kind of takes over you. Even if I shared all the insights that I shared with you, I don't think younger self would understand. So I would not tell any of that. I would just say, keep pushing. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, when the time comes, you will arrive at those ideas and uh, you, you'll get there. It's such, it was such an enlightening experience talking to you today. I just can't thank you enough. Hey folks, hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Adustria Muse. I'm your host, Muhammad Ali here. Today, I'm going to be talking to an amazing guest. And the person I'll be talking to today is Yale University graduate. Plus, he's the founder of Freshman Academy. 
and he helps a lot of brilliant, brilliant minds out there to go to some of the top universities in the world. And I honestly can't wait to talk to this guy today. And, but before we do that, I kindly ask you guys all to subscribe to this channel and that would help us enormously. So without further ado, meet Mr. Valera Arakelian. Mr. Thank you Valera. so much, Mohalini. Such yeah. a pleasure to be here. And guys, do subscribe <laughs> and do support that initiative. I think it's very, very important for our country, what you're doing. So thank you so much. I honestly can't thank you enough for coming on the show today. It just means a lot to me, to all the kids out there who have been wanting to hear from you. So we finally are sitting down to have an extended talk. So and I've got a lot of material I want to uh, get through today. So, but, you know, what do you say we start off like easy, simple? Yeah, absolutely. We, yeah. Uh, would you like to tell our audience a little about yourself for those who don't know? I, I mean, most of you probably don't know me. Uh, I work with a very small a uh, group of students from Central Asia. Um, and what we do, we help uh, them get admitted into top universities. So just in the past four years, we had students who got admitted to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Stanford, uh, the list goes on, NYU Abu Dhabi, Colby, and so on. Um, on uh, Oftentimes those are uh, full scholarships. And by full scholarships, I mean not just tuition covered, but everything mm -hmm. covered, mm -hmm. flights, mm -hmm. accommodation, mm -hmm. uh, food. Um, even sometimes they get a stipend on top of that. Wow. Um, so. In Uzbekistan, um, a handful of students get admitted. Uh, typically, in the past four years, uh, I, I would say a majority of those students are somehow affiliated with uh, the academy that I'm running, which mm -hmm. is Freshman Academy. We bring some of the best people in the world to work with students, not just from Uzbekistan, but from Kazakhstan, Russia. Now we're looking into China. Mm -hmm. uh, we're opening most probably an office in, in Singapore by the end of the year. So um, yeah, it's... Uh, and just about myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I am from Samarkand, uh, born and raised, mm -hmm. um, lived there for all of my life before I moved to mm -hmm. Singapore. And just to correct you there, I'm not a Yale student per se. I'm mm -hmm. a Yale and US student, which was a new campus. And we can discuss mm -hmm. that campus mm -hmm. in particular because it's getting closed. Yeah. Uh, oh. And for, yeah, we, we can get into the reasoning behind that too. But I'm uh, officially a part of Yale alumni. And uh, I'm also National University of Singapore student. I got mm -hmm. a diploma from there, which is mm -hmm. eighth university in the world. Um, so yeah, I mean, when we started this whole thing, uh, I was one of very, very few people who took SATs back mm -hmm. in 2016, 2017. Mm -hmm. Took my IELTS in 2016. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the new batch of students who are taking on that very ambitious and risky project of uh, trying to go abroad, uh, they can't even imagine the kind of reality that we existed there, mm -hmm. where there were literally 30 people on every SAT sitting from entire Uzbekistan. And then it was a, there were no SAT teachers. Mm -hmm. it, it was a completely different kind of reality. Mm -hmm. And when I started my, my journey, people were saying, oh, uh, where are you going to study like Hogwarts or mm -hmm. something? Because they couldn't <laughs> even believe, like my family would, be, would, like, would tell me, yeah. what are you doing? Because I, first year I got rejected from every school I applied uh -huh. for. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot to discuss. I don't yeah. want to uh, to take over your role of asking questions. So sure, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, things have changed a lot since the times when mm -hmm. you were preparing for your university, right? And uh, we'll get to that part later on. But before we do that, what do you say we take a step back and talk a little about your upbringing in Samarkand? Mm -hmm. So, what was it like growing up in Samarkand? Yeah, I feel like it's a IELTS part one question <laughs> or something <laughs> along those lines. No, yeah, uh, not but exactly. it's a very important question. Yeah, I understand I'm, why you're asking that. Uh, and that's the first thing that we're doing, by the way, mm -hmm. when we work with students, mm -hmm. we delve deeper into their childhood because mm -hmm. that's where you find answers to a lot of questions. Uh, that's where you find the root causes of uh, certain patterns of thinking and, and certain predispositions. So in my case, I was born in a family of teachers, mm -hmm. of uh, artists, of uh of intellectuals, basically, mm -hmm. never they never had a business. They uh, it was really weird for them to talk about, say, hiring someone. Mm -hmm. So now, like running a project that's mm -hmm. educational, but at the same time, there's quite a bit of business side mm -hmm. to it. Um, uh, it's it's a bit strange for me mm -hmm. because I, I never was brought up mm -hmm. in having discussions that would be of any value to uh, I, to that. Yeah, I can to totally relate to your experience. I also personally come from family of teachers. My parents yeah. are both teachers and my grandparents, wow. uh, 
they actually never got education. So when I tell them I'm investing in this project, I'm doing that, I'm starting this podcast, constantly talking about risks. Yeah. Because they simply have no concept of yeah. risk taking <laughs> when you, you know, grow up in an environment where you just have you have to take this well trodden path everyone else is taking. Go go to school, get a degree, become a teacher. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And also yes. for them it's weird that you're actually making money on this. Uh-huh. Uh, which I it was which is a sentiment that I very much share in many ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, when we started, I worked for free. And mm-hmm. uh, that freedom that I had running a very small scale operation, mm-hmm. it's something that I look back with nostalgia in mm-hmm. many ways. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, my grandmother, she was a very distinguished uh, English teacher in the Soviet mm-hmm. Union. So she was the one who created some of the curriculums and mm-hmm. it was really rigorous back in the day. Right. So, I actually yeah. saw your grandma in a documentary Oh yeah, the, the yeah, yeah. Documentary yeah. you shared with me—it was yes. your family, and I guess it was your mom and your grandma. Yeah, my mom and, and my grandma. I was so taken aback when I heard your mom start speaking English. Wow. Yeah. Do you, there are families out there where everyone speaks English. Yeah, I mean, uh, mostly my the female side, so my uh-huh. mom and my grandma, uh-huh. and then the male side we had to sort of uh, catch up. My father does not speak English. Uh-huh. Uh, he is an architect. So, uh, my my other grandma, she was a director of a theater in mm-hmm. Samarkand. So I. Uh, was brought up on stage with mm-hmm. actors and uh, that's where my interest in narrative building is coming from mm-hmm. so now what we're doing with with mm-hmm. colleges and we'll get to that it's it's a lot more and again as someone who has been in this field for eight years mm-hmm. it's a lot more about narrative building mm-hmm. than about let's say this buzzword mm-hmm. which is um uh bre- personal branding or mm-hmm. something it's, mm-hmm. it's a lot less about personal branding. It's a lot more about mm-hmm. narratives. Mm-hmm. And when you, are, uh, when you spend most of your childhood in a, mm-hmm. in a theater and you interacted with plays, you interacted with actors and how they perform, mm-hmm. that's something that is guiding me now when we help students uh, put down their own narratives from so many different pathways that they can take, from so many different directions that they can approach their life. We need to single out 650 word essay essentially. Mm-hmm. And that, that background really does help me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have a whole post on Instagram where I showed what I learned from every family member that I had. But I'm coming from a very, I would say, uh, in many ways conservative, mm-hmm. uh, even though I tried to push that as much as possible with mm-hmm. my audacious behavior and mm-hmm. the sort of going to Tashkent to shoot an interview when I was 17. Wow. We realized that actually a setup like that, interviews, mm-hmm. um, even before... Uh, I mean, for your Russian speakers, they probably know, uh, Russian speaking audience, they probably know Yuri Dutz and uh, sort of the new wave mm-hmm. of uh, uh, podcasters and, and mm-hmm. so on. Eight years ago, we realized that was a great networking tool. So we reached out, one of the uh, people who I reached out uh, to was Alexey Ulko, who is an IELTS examiner himself, who really shaped my view mm-hmm. uh, of, uh, of the IELTS exam as a whole. Mm-hmm. And uh, he built that foundation of my mm-hmm. view on IELTS, and we can talk more about that. I'm very interested in v- your view on, uh, on IELTS in many ways. But at the time, I don't think mm-hmm. he was a niner even, but he is, to this day, I don't know if he uh, retook his IELTS or whatever, mm-hmm. maybe for, for his work, but he's one of the far most linguists uh, one of the most distinguished linguists who always believed that exam taking is um, instrumental. It's sort of seen as practical, but then there's a lot more beyond that mm-hmm. where we're talking about genuine knowledge beyond exam taking, mm-hmm. beyond the practical, mm-hmm. where you just do things because you enjoy them. Mm-hmm. So I would say I'm, I'm a person who is really, uh, is a combination of many things that cannot be combined. Mm-hmm. You know, the East and the West uh, and that exposure that I had in both mm-hmm. countries, that business mindset, entrepreneurial mindset mm-hmm. that I have, and a deep intellectual class, post-Soviet uh, people, like group of people who believe that making money is immoral mm-hmm. in itself, which, again, I learned a lot from them. There, there's, mm-hmm. a, there's a lot of insight in what they're saying. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's more or less. So I really, I'm really curious what Valeria was like back in high school. Yeah. Right. But right before you started applying to all these top universities, so what, what, what were you like at the time? Um, yeah. So to narrow down the question here, so what was your basically experience of preparing for your university studies, yeah. like your IELTS, your SATs, extracurriculars, which yeah. I'm sure overlaps with your high school period, right? Yeah. High school life. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, would you like to talk about that as well? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, look, uh, when I was 12, uh, that was the first... Uh, experience of teaching that I mm-hmm. had. 
So I teaching. attended of teaching. Yes. Of teaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At uh, the I age attended, of 12. Yeah, at the age of 12. Wow. Okay. Uh, my grandma, so she taught me the basics of English. Uh -huh. uh, since the time I was, since 7 to 12, it mm -hmm. was what, five years? I mean, in five years you can learn a lot mm -hmm. uh, in English. Mm -hmm. And then I took a very, um, I mean, I was, I was teaching grammar, like the basics of it. Mm -hmm. And, and who, uh, who was your audience at the time? Uh, some like distant relatives of ours uh -huh. who came to Uzbekistan for summer, uh -huh. like something along those lines. Yeah. And then uh, for us, IELTS at the time, it was a new wave, basically. Mm -hmm. it, it was just starting out, I mean, 2014, 13. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I really liked talking about all sorts of different topics, which were beyond, you know, those classic, I guess, Soviet textbooks where you just talk about your family, you talk mm -hmm. about, and then you start talking about international economics and you start talking about some more contentious topics. And then at the time I was like, wow, IELTS is something very, very different. So I really delved into this whole IELTS thing. And then I attended a speaking club um, uh, by one of the teachers in uh, Samarkand. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, it was super, super influential mm -hmm. uh, for and me at the time. You might want to give them some credit as well if you want to mention their name yeah, or their uh, school. Yeah, Vladimir Antorovich. Uh, so he uh, was the one who really introduced me into, mm -hmm. and he still uh, uh, teaches in, in Samarkand. He introduced me to IELTS speaking, which I guess pushed me to go beyond and, mm -hmm. and explore the different themes and topics and just, you know, it does have a positive, as much as I am not a big fan of test taking now and exam uh, and exams, um, I do think that IELTS really pushed a lot of people in Uzbekistan to build their horizon uh, and world outlook and worldview to a point where they can talk about those things mm -hmm. in the first place. So that was my introduction into IELTS. And then we started the first English speaking uh, debate club in Samarkand. And then I was just 14, uh, the rest were 17 and above. And then uh, during one of the sessions, it was sort of an internal competition to decide who be the judge at that mm -hmm. debate um, community. And what happened was that somehow I won at the age of 14. So that was the beginning, I guess, of my mm -hmm. deeper involvement. And my mom is a guide, so she took me um, with, with her to different uh, tours and some of her tourists. And by the way, this is the kind of profile of uh, people who come to Uzbekistan in the first place. They typically traveled around the world, uh, world quite a bit. Uh, a lot of them are, are actually from academia. Mm -hmm. So I spent a fair amount of time when I was young with those professors from mm -hmm. Oxford, from Cambridge, from uh, not from the US though, but mostly from UK uh, unis. And then they would tell me stories about, oh, did you know that it's actually possible to get a scholarship? And I didn't even know the word scholarship at the mm -hmm. time. So they, they would tell me all this. And I always had that hope that something was out there for me uh, at the time where, just to give you some perspective, in my college, uh, my the director of my college was really proud that I believe 15 or 20% of my classmates got admitted anywhere. Wow. And I mean anywhere, mm -hmm. local unis, mostly uh, local and Russian universities, but at the time, but 20% from my college got admitted anywhere, 80% did not pursue higher education. And that was that kind of environment where I really pushed for, mm -hmm. okay, let's go for that dream. Um, yeah. Wow. So, and how did things, you know, turn out after you had your IELTS? Right. So, so where did uh, you go from there? I taught IELTS a lot more than I prepared for it <laughs> <laughs> somehow. Right. So, uh, and that's something that, uh, that's a question I have for you. Do you think mm -hmm. there's uh, score inflation that has happened? Because I know for a fact that on the SATs, it, it is the mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a sc like scores inflation. Let's say if you take 1520, 1500, five years ago, I don't think it corresponds to mm -hmm. uh, 1500 now necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is there the same kind of process that's happening? So here's my take asked. on uh, the fact that everyone is getting a nine these days. Like there are a lot of people who are getting nine, a lot of people getting eight, 8.5s. Yeah. When five, 10 years ago, if you told someone, well, I got a seven, they'd think that you are the best, the yes. best, right? But yeah. that's not the case anymore. And I don't think there is really such thing as score inflation. Instead, I'd like to think that just people are just stepping up their game. People are just getting better. Do you think they're getting better in English mm -hmm. or you think they're getting better in test taking specifically mm -hmm. in preparing for IELTS? Uh, you could say both actually, because now we have more experience. We've mm -hmm. built experience. Like mm -hmm. we know how to, we know the tips and the tricks. And aside mm -hmm. from that, people are becoming more, I think, more intellectually curious. 
mm-hmm. by learning languages, mm-hmm. which wasn't quite the case back then because at the time people were more conservative minded. So I'd, mm-hmm. I'd like to think that these days people are now coming under the influence of all different cultures and they're, they're starting to realize that there's a whole yeah. universe out there and the only way to connect with it is learning English. Mm-hmm. So English serves as a bridge. Mm-hmm. It's like a, literally number one step you have to take if mm-hmm. you want to go anywhere abroad, right? Be able to join the global community. So yeah. it's not a surprise that a, a lot of people now getting 8, 8.5s and 9s. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I actually got asked a specific question by IDP on my third podcast when we had four niners. Mm-hmm. And off the record, they asked me, so what do you think? Well, do you have any theory why there are so many niners now? Mm-hmm. Uh, as of now, there are probably 20, 25, 30 Niners mm. in Uzbekistan, if not mm. many more. So, and my, my thinking here is, it, it's, it's mostly due to the fact that there is this cultural exposure that's taking place, more foreigners coming into Uzbekistan, mm. right? And there are more of these podcasts happening, right? Mm. But it, I, I, this is probably, I don't think this is the only English podcast in Uzbekistan. I'm sure there are other guys having podcasts in English. You, you would not have thought in your wildest dreams one day Uzbeks would be having podcasts Right. In English. Yeah. yeah. In English. Yeah. May- maybe that's yeah. the case. Uh, my theory is that we got better at cracking IELTS mm-hmm. also, mm-hmm. at preparing for IELTS as, a, as, a, uh, as an exam. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where a lot of it is coming from. Uh, I mean, back in, uh, I, I took the IELTS exam eight years ago in 2016. Mm-hmm. So I was and the one who also. Quick, quick record. Yeah. So a nine was my dream. I would just like, uh-huh. I, would, I would just yeah, put it out there. Yeah, go ahead. You said, what was your score at the time? Uh, I got eight. Uh, in your first attempt? In my first attempt. That, that's incredible. Yeah. In your first attempt, getting eight. I got eight in my third attempt. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and again, uh, I really focused on mm-hmm. the basics of English. Mm-hmm. I really. Like to me, all this IELTS prep and then templates and whatever, this is something that I was not really mm-hmm. a big fan of. So even in my teaching approach mm-hmm. back in the day, I always was like, guys, mm-hmm. uh, there is the test taking side and there is mm-hmm. genuine knowledge of English. Mm-hmm. And those two things, they overlap, but mm-hmm. oftentimes they don't overlap. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are a lot of things that I, a lot of opi- opinions that I changed about um, pre- preparing and just learning English. And since then, like back in the day, I thought pronunciation was a big factor. I mm. thought that, oh, having that American accent or mm. British accent was really important. But then when I went to Yale, and I mean Yale, Yale in the US for a summer program that I did, and then you interact with professors who are incredibly knowledgeable, their vocabulary is probably 3x mine. And then um, a lot of them had strong Norwegian accents. A lot of them had strong Italian accents, and they had mm-hmm. no problem as long as mm-hmm. they uh, they were understandable. They you know uh, uh, pronounce words in the correct way. Maybe it was their specific, I guess, influences from their language. I mean, there's a lot. That was a whole journey. But back in the day, nine was my dream. Mm-hmm. When I called my mom, and again, uh, mind you, it's 2016. I was probably one of three, four people in mm-hmm. Samarkand who got AIDS. Mm-hmm. Uh, not even on their first attempts or whatever. I called my mom and then I was like, oh, I got an eight. And then she, she was like, why not 8.5 and why, why not nine? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. What and, a harsh uh, mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then they, of course, supported me a lot. But then that was the point where I realized, I'm like, yeah, you, you're right. I mean, I could have done better, but mm-hmm. it was it was good. It mm-hmm. was good enough. I, I, didn't, I didn't need more. Mm-hmm. And then uh, to apply to unis at least. Mm-hmm. And then... I remember this one night where I realized that it was not IELTS or SAT when you applied to unis, but it was IELTS and SAT. Uh Because back in the day, nobody, again, nobody Uh applied, nobody got admitted. Mm -hmm. And when I say nobody, um, at least in the public space, like Mm -hmm. there were no names there. Mm -hmm. I mean, someone here and there, maybe uh, from Tashk International School, I didn't even know such such an institution existed back in the day. So uh, it was devastating. Mm-hmm. It was devastating to learn that IELTS was not enough. I already had, you know, all these images of studying at Yale and Harvard, and mm-hmm. then I learned about that. And then, uh, again, I, I assume that your audience is quite young. Mm-hmm. I don't know how they imagine 2016 mm-hmm. was like, but it was a situation where we did not have Visa or MasterCards. So you couldn't even pay for your SAT exam. Like it was that kind of situation. So I had to call my relatives in the US Mm -hmm. and just be like, hey, can you please pay for my exam? Mm -hmm. And then I showed up to the exam. But the thing is, you know how there's like a new SAT thing? Mm -hmm. It was new SAT for like, like basically what we call old SAT was new SAT for Mm -hmm. me back in the day. So I prepared by like the books and material, like with the help of the books and materials 
that preceded that period, they were a lot more difficult than they are right now, mm -hmm. like a lot, a lot more. And I had like a week to prepare. I come to the exam and it was a new SAT, mm -hmm. like the first, or maybe like a couple more times when they had this new format of the exam, I go there and I realize that I prepared for the wrong, like for a completely wrong exam, for a different exam. Oh and then I had this whole journey of retaking SATs five mm -hmm. to six times, uh, mm -hmm. depending on whether you count, there were like SAT subjects by, back in the mm -hmm. day. You used to write like an essay that was, so you had one hour to read quite a solid passage, and then you had to write 800 words on that in an hour. In an hour. Yeah. That's much more challenging than IELTS yeah. writing. That's, yeah. And you just sit there and you're like, whoa, like I just got <laughs> eight. Like I thought I'm on like on the, and, and that's yeah. where I became skeptical of these exams too, because, yeah. you know, you think you're on top of the world. Mm -hmm. And then I eventually got 1520 mm -hmm. super score, not, not uh -huh. even the uh, 1520. I think I was very, very prepared. And then you go into college and you're like, oh my, oh my God, like mm -hmm. this is a different level. Mm -hmm. This is like nothing, like nowhere close to what I mm -hmm. got exposed to back home. This is not IELTS or SAT, it's, it's, it's a completely different. And then, you know, IB exams, they are probably the most rigorous mm -hmm. uh, uh, just curriculums and exams in the world right now. Oh. Uh, IBs. So what are those? You might uh, so uh, there are lots of different, I mean, when we're talking about private schools and they're kind of getting integrated into public schools more and more now, there are internationally developed, and, uh, developed curriculums mm -hmm. that there are exams on and they are the ones that are testing your analytical thinking, research skills. They are uh, essentially, imagine if top experts created a curriculum for you to study in school and then you would mm -hmm. go through that and, and it's super rigorous, super competitive. I, and is that, it like one of those A-level tests, A-level exams? Yeah, pretty much so, pretty yeah. much so. so um, A-level is Cambridge standard and how about IBs? I'm, 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 I'm actually not that knowledgeable. I would uh, mm -hmm. uh, resort not to, uh, not to uh, speak about that, uh -huh. uh, partly because I'm not from that system at all. Uh -huh. uh, I studied in a public school right. and I only had experience of interacting with people who went through that system. Mm -hmm. And then from what I saw, I mean, uh, we had, uh, so in Singapore, where our campus located, there is a school nearby. Mm -hmm. And then in that school, about 30 or 40% of all perfect IB scorers in the world, they study there. Wow. So 30 to 40%. And then a lot of them went into one mm -hmm. college. So Yale and US was very much Yale on steroids mm -hmm. academically, <laughs> like very much so. Yeah. So um, you look at these guys and then they spend their lifetime preparing mm -hmm. academically for that challenge mm -hmm. and they were struggling. And me, like after a gap year, and the first time I applied, I got rejected from every school I apply, like I, I, I apply for. After three years of uh, in uh, in Uzbek college, where um, mm -hmm. I basically, I, I mean, I, I just participated in Olympiads, mm -hmm. uh, Econ's Olympiad, English Olympiad. Mm -hmm. I would get some places, and then, uh, mm -hmm. and then that's it. Like I, I would attend classes, not that regularly, uh, but then I didn't need to put that much effort there. Mm -hmm. uh, you just read a book and you're ultimately the best, like <laughs> by definition, right? right. Uh, and then from there you go into that system where mm -hmm. you have all of this, what looked to me g like geniuses from mm -hmm. all parts of the world who did all of mm -hmm. this fancy curriculums and everything and it's, had to compete against yeah, them. Yeah, it's, it's like a local player get, moving up leagues. Yeah, you know, going from, it's like you're a big fish here. You're like yeah. IELTS aider, I guess. I don't know, like there right. was no term for that back in the day. But then like SCT 1520, I was mm -hmm. like also one of very, mm -hmm. very few people at the time, but also very few people took it in the first mm -hmm. place. So that's something yeah, that's important to note. Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of, Again, when I'm talking about my achievements in the day, I hope that people understand that I look at them from a very different light right mm -hmm. now. Because if you put them in comparison with the kind of academic challenges that I faced in college, mm -hmm. it's it's incomparable. It's Let's say first assignment in college, I have this thousand word essay. Mm -hmm. And I never wrote a thousand word essays outside of SATs. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I had like one day to do that. Mm -hmm. I was like, wait, what? Like you could write a thousand word essays in one day and then mm -hmm. I struggled a lot. I uh, asked people for help. Fast forward four years in college. My last semester, I had a uh, freshman. I ran freshman. I had part-time job, 20 hours per week. That's a lot. That's mm -hmm. that's proper part-time uh, job. Mm -hmm. And then around 20 hours per week. And then I had Yellow US classes and I had to write a diploma work, which uh, was somewhere around 12 to 13,000 uh, words. 
And then I ended up writing this whole thing in three days and getting A minus on that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's the that's the story of pretty much every student. Let yeah, me tell you that. Okay, I my dissertation was also r- roughly that size, yeah. the ten thousand word dissertation, and I literally wrote it the night before the deadline. Yes, the night before the deadline. Yeah, for some reason, it's the default nature of every student. We just cram everything. No, I, honestly, not every. I, I know maybe three other students uh-huh. who ever did it in the history of mm-hmm. uh, at least uh, in my year. Mm-hmm. Maybe two, three other students did it because it's. The, the the rigorous standard uh-huh. um, of even formatting itself. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had a hundred references, a hundred books mm-hmm. that I had to refer to mm-hmm. in my in my uh, paper. It's it's, it's, yeah. it's actually it's actually a good thing. You know why? Yeah. Because you said you did it in three days when you thought you should have done it in say two months or three months, right? Uh, there's this concept. Uh, I don't exactly know who came up with it, mm-hmm. but and here how how it goes. It goes. Work usually expands to fill yeah. the time available. Yeah, fill the time for, for, available available. for its yeah. completion, right? Yeah. So I guess that that's that's. Yeah, I, well, honestly, I hope you're really not advocating for that. And uh-huh. I hope you're not advocating for that uh, for a simple reason. Yeah. Uh, it really does not work. Uh-huh. It really does not work. And the fact that it worked in my case uh, was mm-hmm. just I think of it as uh, just a happy. Mm-hmm. Uh, lucky experience Uh Uh, if you want to become uh, good at anything excel at anything you need to properly approach it and uh, i would not advise anyone to to go about it this way but also in college i set my priorities straight Mm -hmm. Uh, my priority was not to get uh, Mm -hmm. high grades my Mm -hmm. priority was to learn so and and again those things they do overlap but if you look at the experience of my classmates Mm -hmm. a lot of them were Uh, phenomenal in terms of their grades. Mm -hmm. But then what did they actually take from college? I think what I learned from college, and this is something that many professors shared with me. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, the way you came into college and the way how you're leaving college, it's the... The get like the transformation was yeah. uh, was uh, very strong, and partly because I was super open minded, I did not care as much about doing things in the precise way that the professor wanted. Mm-hmm. I cared more about actually remembering lots of different uh, insights and lessons from 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 college, and they do guide mm-hmm. me right now. And by the way, just a little disclaimer. College and university, they're different. When we say when I say college in the context of Uzbekistan, I mean mm-hmm. uh, college. Uh, the way we understand it, when I mean uh, when I say college in the context mm-hmm. of U.S. system, mm-hmm. it's where you get your bachelor's degree, essentially. Yeah. 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 So uh, when we say, "Oh, he got admitted to Yale University," he mm-hmm. actually got admitted to, or she got admitted, uh, you actually get admitted into Yale College. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, not Yale University per se. Right. Right. I'll, I want to hear more from you about your university, but mm-hmm. before we get to that part, I, I was really hoping if we could. Uh, Elaborate more on your college application experience, yeah, of course. because students really want to see sort of a like a you know blueprint of yeah. how to go from having IELTS eight to getting into mm-hmm. Yale. Yeah, yeah, right. This is not to say that this blueprint works for everyone, yeah, right? Yeah. Yes, because you asked to put this disclaimer. Oh yeah, we, we can yeah. we can we can make that disclaimer here too. Right. Um, when it comes to podcasts in general, I think as a format is extremely mm-hmm. like it's it's exciting, mm-hmm. it's fun, and then uh, you can say stuff confidently, and then mm-hmm. you know uh, believe in it in the mm-hmm. moment. Uh, I just want to stress one point. Um, whatever I'm saying here, it's to my best knowledge right now, mm-hmm. and also it's in the context of basically stream stream of consciousness, mm-hmm. right? Where you just sit there and then for two hours you just mm-hmm. share and share and share. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very different from sitting and then editing. That's mm-hmm. the approach that I like. Mm-hmm. I'm a much better writer and editor than mm-hmm. I'm a speaker, right. much better. So uh, if it were like a long post or a book, I would be very confident there yeah. because I would edit it and peer edit it and so on and so forth. Uh, here we're in a context where I might be saying something that mm-hmm. would not be accurate um, or I would not believe in, let's say, mm-hmm. in, in a year. Uh, I would, like approach everything with skepticism. Right. right? That's that's right. something that, yeah, I advise yeah. most pa- podcasters start their podcast was that approach everything with mm-hmm. a healthy level of skepticism, including what mm-hmm. I'm about to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it's, it's also very subjective too. When it comes to admissions, there's a tendency where people who just got admitted, they think that whatever worked for them would work for everyone. And then as someone who worked with some of the best students in Uzbekistan and Central Asia, and I mean, like really some of the best, and uh, they they pushed me a lot oftentimes, even after mm-hmm. four years in college, oftentimes the questions that they asked, the experiences that they had, they pushed me a lot with it. Um, the, their paths to getting admitted were so diverse 
that I don't even know at this point. I mm. mean, I told you about this one student who wrote an essay in defense of Russian language mm -hmm. after the Russian-Ukraine war started. And then that student got admitted into this very prestigious scholarship that 15 students mm -hmm. out of 55,000 uh, get. With I would, that controversial I would name, essay. Yeah, with that controversial essay. I would not be able to, uh, yeah. But again, um, of course it was uh, nuanced. Of course mm -hmm. it was extremely deep and insightful. But uh, who knew that, mm -hmm. you know, that, topic in itself can be so powerful mm -hmm. and then there are so many diversity of topics diversity of pathways there's no one mm -hmm. and that would be one of my biggest uh mm -hmm. lessons one of the one of the most um insightful ideas that mm -hmm. i uh i arrived at in my admissions journey right. but then 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 what is like how do you approach those questions i guess that's that's a question if there's so many ways to getting in how do you advise anyone on, because there's so many choices, mm -hmm. right, uh, that uh, you have when you apply. So what do you say we right now talk about first your own experience? Yeah, we, we can start with my own experience. Yeah, but again, highly subjective, yeah. uh, temporally and geographically, uh, uh, you know, focused and limited and narrow to uh, Samarkand and me at mm -hmm. the time. So I applied first year. I thought that I have such a strong advantage of being from Uzbekistan mm -hmm. and that they, do, they I just looked up their charts. Let's say for Yale, mm -hmm. like 10 years, uh, for 10 years, there were no Uzbek citizens. Mm -hmm. Before that, I don't even know, like maybe, maybe the same, but I knew that for at least like 10 years, mm -hmm. you can pull up the numbers and you could see no Uzbek students in bachelors. So you thought- In masters there were. Yeah. And I was like, wow, there are no Uzbek students. Maybe no one applies mm -hmm. because I never heard anyone apply. So if I apply, of course, they will, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they will admit me. And then so, I actually had a chance to apply to Yale and US because it was like, tick, you tick the box and then mm -hmm. you apply to Yale and Yale and US at the same time. And at the time I was like, what is that Yale and US thing? Mm -hmm. uh, I can get into Yale and Harvard and whatever. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just applied. So um, you thought coming from an underrepresented group yes. could become potentially your yes. Yeah, I was super confident. Yes. I was like super confident because yeah. nobody was even talking about it. Uh -huh. I was like, guys, you're nuts. Like, why is no one talking about SATs? Mm -hmm. And then I'm talking about some of the beast, biggest uh, IELTS centers. They didn't even know what SATs mm -hmm. were at the time. Mm -hmm. So it just, and I know it because I literally went to Tashkent to prepare for the SATs mm -hmm. and I would enter every single educational center. And then they would just be like, they were like, mm -hmm. what are you talking about? Um, so, uh, to me, it was like, okay, I apply, get in. I mm -hmm. mean, who else is applying from Samarkand, from a public school and uh, and all that? Uh, it turns out I was really wrong. Mm -hmm. I was very, very wrong. Every single university I applied for, I got rejected in my first year. Uh -huh. And it was devastating. And then that ridicule that I experienced from everyone around me and, and to a certain extent from my family too, but I can't blame my family in any way. I mean, any sensible parent would be like, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> right? Like this is this is wild. This yeah. is wild. So uh, when it's it's when a kid says to his dad, "Dad, I want to play for Real Madrid one day." Or yeah, Barcelona. yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, go ahead, like try it, and then they miserably fail, and then they they, they saw the psychological impact it had on me because I, I felt like I lost my dream, I lost my my mm. my vision uh, for life, and when I got rejected, I was like, okay. Maybe I will go to Westminster. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe that's that's the way to go, and then so uh, I can try a uh, masters, or maybe I go to Gimo in Russia, uh -huh. or maybe I go somewhere somewhere else. I went to Wyatt actually. It's a pretty good university. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I very much agree. And we can get back. But aside, aside aside from you know in, in recent years though, I think the university has been growing. Yeah. It's it's got a lot of students now because mm -hmm. I remember when I was about to graduate, the university had to extend. Mm. Like they bought another building right next door and they turned that. into part of their campus and there were so many students. The place is crawling with students. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And, then, and then there was this narrative that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Westminster picked uh, quality over uh, mm -hmm. uh, quantity over quality mm -hmm. and, and so on. Yeah, it's I do remember that. A lot of my, my friends studied at uh, Westminster. I think it's a, from a social perspective, mm -hmm. I think you guys had a lot uh, more interesting mm -hmm. social life from what I've seen. I honestly can't speak to that because I was the least soci sociable guy at university. I was more into just work, 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 yeah. uh, lecture, school, lecture, mm. learn. So I was one of those nerds. Yeah, I mean, I mean, of course, it's, uh, it, it, 
is not the same for everyone, but it seems like the social scene was really good. And mm -hmm. then when I started looking into academics, that's where I think that there are some challenges when it comes to the academic side. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but still, I mean, mm -hmm. I would prefer Westminster over a lot of American unis. Mm -hmm. That's one of the biggest, um, I guess, myths about mm -hmm. American universities that they're all the same. They're all homogenous. They're mm -hmm. all, you know, moral. It's, it's US mm -hmm. after all, but it's not the case. Singapore, same story. I know a lot of students who study at MDIS, uh, who study at, there's this place called SPJ in there. And then most students from Uzbekistan in Singapore, they actually work uh, two shifts mm -hmm. to provide for themselves. And uh, often, oftentimes when they go, they tell them, hey, $500 is enough to uh, survive in Singapore, including mm -hmm. all of your expenses. And then they go there and it's heartbreaking. Okay, I'm going on a tangent, but uh, just, like, just to finish a point, it's heartbreaking to see the price that those students pay for thinking that Singapore uh, is ultimately, you know, uh, it's Singapore, right? Mm -hmm. But within Singapore, there's a lot of variation. Within the US, there's a lot of variation. So most schools, I would say, I would prefer Westminster uh, compared to most schools in the US. So for those students who fail to get into those one of those top universities, why it Singapore can be their contingency plan? I mean, Singapore in Singapore, again, I don't know if we have a pipeline mm -hmm. into solid unis, let's say National University of Singapore and Nanyang. I think MDIS in Singapore, I heard stories, and again, I would not, it's, it's sort of a gossip at this point, but mm -hmm. from firsthand experience of students there, where they're put in the classroom of all Uzbek students. Mm -hmm. You know, you come from Uzbekistan and then you end up studying with Uzbek students, mm -hmm. or the majority of them are Uzbek students, right? And then from that, uh, that standpoint, why would you want to uh, study abroad mm -hmm. if you guys are all cramped in the same classrooms that mm -hmm. you could have, rep you, you, could, you could do that at, at Westminster, mm -hmm. essentially. So, um, so yeah, but it, it, of course, but some people prefer to just, you know, they just want to get out of Uzbekistan, I guess. I, I'm not a big fan of that kind of motivation. Mm -hmm. Most of the students who work with, one of the prerequisites is actually, what do you want to do with that education? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is like, oh, I just want to immigrate from Uzbekistan, then for my team, it doesn't make sense to prepare another smart kid for us, whereas there's so many, so much talent there. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes we work with students who are, you know, patriotic uh, about making some change here and contributing with that kind of education here. But that's, I can that's, totally attest to that because I had I've had yeah. I've been having conversations with a lot of the go those guys who got into uh, Northwest University in Qatar, and there's this guy who got into Toronto University in Canada, and there's another guy who got into Yale, and a lot of them actually want to come back and make a difference in their community. Mm -hmm. So this uh, one guy I had on the podcast the other time who's from Navai was telling me about how horrible mine situation is mining. They got mm. mine gold in yeah, Navai. Yeah. So yes. how horrible the situation, people work in atrocious conditions and they, and, and he, he was telling me that if you get injured, chances are you're dying. Yeah. No one is coming to your rescue. And he said he helped them develop mm. a device that can track you so someone can come to, come to your rescue. And he was telling me that the only way forward, the only way to tackle those issues is engineering. So he wants to go study engineering at Toronto University and bring all that back That's home, phenomenal. right? That's phenomenal. And make make a difference in this community. Yeah. So and Wait, I'm who, glad who, to. Who's someone from Yale that you mentioned that someone got admitted to Yale? Mr. Rustam Noor. Ah, Mr. Rustam Noor. Yeah, yeah, very good he was friend. On the podcast. And, yeah. yeah, this podcast is coming out. Uh, by the time we drop this podcast, the podcast will have will be on social media. Wow. So wow. Yeah, he's our second student. Yeah. Uh, who got and, into Yale. Yeah, phenomenal guy. Uh -huh. Yeah, phenomenal guy. Uh, but yeah, j just uh, to clarify one point, I understand that I said uh, things critical of MJS mm -hmm. in Singapore. Mm -hmm. I think MJS in, in Uzbekistan, Westminster, Webster, uh, they're very, very solid choices. And even uh, MJS in Singapore, but just mm -hmm. again, be mindful of certain disadvantages that you will get mm -hmm. with getting education that's affordable, that's in mm -hmm. the... Uh, developed country and and so on but yeah it's just it's more of a critique of expectations versus reality rather mm -hmm. than uh, those institutions because they serve a particular kind of people mm -hmm. who genuinely you know some of them just want to experience something other than a local kind of education i just think that there are more there are better options in terms of investment and then uh payback there are um, higher value things mm -hmm. that you can get uh for relatively less investment mm -hmm. that's what 
that's what I'm saying, I guess. So for the amount of time and money you're spending on preparation, yeah. you might actually get better education. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Not just preparation, but also like, um, say, how much you're spending mm -hmm. on your education. Uh, there are these commercial universities in the U.S. that give you partial scholarships. Mm -hmm. And then what organizations here do, they stack up those scholarships and say, oh, our students received $2 million of scholarships. Uh -huh. But then what, what it means is that they apply to like 50 unis mm -hmm. that you guaranteed get admitted somewhere. Mm -hmm. And those unis to lure talent from, from abroad, they give them 30% scholarship, which mm -hmm. on paper is, let's say, $150,000, but in reality, you still need to pay $200,000. <laughs> so it doesn't make any yeah. sense. So when you say 3 million, uh -huh. it's, it, it's, it's the most ridiculous thing that I, I've mm -hmm. seen. Um, but yeah, like you can't compare 3 million in 50 unis where on average you get 15K or whatever, 60K mm -hmm. out of 400,000. Mm -hmm. And someone like Rustam who got full ride and then I think he is even getting a stipend or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rustam, such a such a brilliant guy, yes. such a brilliant guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mentioned to you this program that we had, Advanced English, mm -hmm. which introduced students into philosophy, into social sciences, into. Back in the day, I used to create a new curriculum curriculum for it every month because my job was to learn more on top of my college. Mm -hmm. So I read a lot of books, and let's say out of ten books that I read, I would pick one and then cover them uh, cover that book with students, and Rustam he set a record with the number of those courses that he took. He, I think he didn't miss a single one. So mm -hmm. for eight months, we did eight new curriculums. I think he attended every single program mm -hmm. that we did there. And yeah, I mean... No, and no wonder why he got into Yale, right? Uh, I mean, uh, it, it's... It's it's him. Uh, mm -hmm. You can you, you can do that to 200 students, but then uh, I I can't mm -hmm. claim that. But uh, the, it was a very profound proliferating symbiosis of our approach, and then his open mindedness and brilliant uh, uh, yeah brilliance mm -hmm. and uh, yeah phenomenal phenomenal uh, student from Uzbekistan. Also deeply rooted in uh, Kirk, I, I mean sorry that I'm spoiling uh, like a, a spoiling uh, providing a spoiler for that episode, but mm -hmm. very deeply rooted in Kirkalpak experience mm -hmm. in Errol C, for example, and and so on. So yeah, I. Yeah have very high hopes for, for them contributing to the future of our country, right. for sure. For sure, right. Amazing guy. Yeah, amazing guy. It was a pleasure talking to him. So going back to your prep, mm -hmm. so af what happened after you did your SAT and IELTS? Like, because that yeah. part is still quite unclear. Like, how did you... <laughs> Online there's resources, still, there's space yeah. space between you going from doing your SAT to getting into Yale? Like, what happened mm -hmm. in between? Mm -hmm in the interim. Yeah, so uh, what happened was that uh, there, there were some essays mm -hmm. that I just wrote myself. Uh, I don't remember if the first year I got the help from my English teacher, mm -hmm. Vladimir Antorovich from Samarkand. Second time I for sure did, but also have a family of English uh, teachers. So a lot of them had their input and then they, they did support me a lot there. So, uh, and I read a lot online. Mm -hmm. I read like everything that I uh, could put my, uh, my mind to. Like, yeah, uh, just churning through materials and materials. Mm -hmm. off and then what I quickly realized it was not really helpful because as I read successful Harvard essays successful Yale essays I realized that I subconsciously adopt the vocabulary the grammar structures and everything which in uh, like should not be a problem uh, but the, the thing is that admissions is all about your unique voice it's about what you have to say in the way how you say things generally mm -hmm. and then i just realized that it really blurs my focus in terms of what i want to say mm -hmm. not just in terms of language but also in terms of ideas so i quickly set it aside and i was like okay i want to be a little bit in that zen mood and zen mode and then let me represent my cases as strongly as i can so the first uh, time i applied my essays were not that strong, obviously. And then mm -hmm. uh, first SAT that I had was 1400. Uh, so I applied with 1410 SATs and IELTS 8 and then those essays. I got rejections from every single university except for Princeton where I got waitlisted. Where right now I understand waitlist is just another rejection ultimately. <laughs> but back in the day, it was this little grain of hope where I was like, hey, uh, it's something special. I mean, maybe they saw something in me or maybe like there was something there. And then while I was getting those rejections, one of the projects that we worked on at our college, uh, for, for which I'm, I'm very, very thankful to my college for that, because every year we sent a group of entrepreneurs to propose a project at the British Council. I don't remember how it was, I, I, business challenge or something, entrepreneurship challenge, it was like mm -hmm. a national thing where every region sent uh, their kids. And then, 
uh, I applied with that thing there. And then my team went to Tashkent to represent our business idea, which, by the way, was really stupid. I mean, uh, my friend just found online that you can imprint seeds, in, uh, seeds into paper. Mm -hmm. And then uh, from that paper, you can make like a cup or something. And then when you use it, you can just plant it uh, and then something will grow from it. Absolutely ridiculous idea. <laughs> At the time, we thought it was quirky. And then what we did was we adapted that idea onto Samarkand paper plant. Mm -hmm. That's a part of our, I guess, almost like national heritage. Uh, there's this paper plant in Samarkand mm -hmm. uh, and the, the whole village that's called Konigil. And then we went there like, okay, is it even feasible? And then we developed a concept based on the Uzbek experience, mm -hmm. right? So it's one thing to have an idea in business, another thing, know how to execute it and have a plan. So we took an idea that existed and then we adapted it to our context. And then in Tashkent, we get second place. Uh, but then what my teacher from college, uh, you know, did, he called me next day and he said, hey, look, there is this UN competition in Geneva, in Switzerland, that is very, very similar to that. You already have a concept, apply. Like, let's see what happens. And then it was really, you know, it was like nighttime, one of those nights, I just looked at the application portal. It was like two hours of work there. Mm -hmm. I was like, should I do it? I mean, what's the chance that we get admitted? It's only like three projects out of 150 projects. And I was like, okay, yeah, whatever, let's just apply. So I apply there and then I completely forget about it. And sometime in three, four weeks, I get a call from an unknown number. I pick it up and then someone starts questioning me. I'm like, in English, I'm like, wait, what's going on? They're like, look guys, you submitted your business proposal, right? Um, the, the thing is that you, your email was wrong. So we could not reach out to you in any other way. And then we decided to just like call you. And then while speaking, I realized that the person on the phone had a little bit of post-Soviet accent. And then I realized she was from Belarus. And uh -huh. then we switched to Russian immediately. <laughs> and he's like, hey guys, like, look, uh, you're the youngest in this competition. Yeah. And we, it just happened so that your idea is bad, but, <laughs> but the other idea is even worse. <laughs> so uh, we decided to invite you as a part of this, like what, yeah. I think five or... I think there were five mm -hmm. projects from mm -hmm. all over the world. So, yeah. yeah. You would assume that you're getting a call from KBG. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what's going on here? Right, like, what's right. going on here? And then uh, we had a month to go to uh, even less, three or two weeks. And that whole thing is like mm -hmm. a separate story on how we got visas and everything. Right. Uh, it was really fun. Uh, but then, yeah, I was 17. My friend was 18, mm -hmm. my partner. Um, he has a birthday tomorrow, by the way. That's why I have to leave yeah. uh, back uh, to Samarkand tomorrow. Uh, and then we went to Geneva mm -hmm. to present it during the actual mm -hmm. real UN conference in Geneva. Wow. So 17, 18, we came there and it was so fun because, again, we're college students from Uzbekistan. Uh -huh. like, what do we know? They're like, your passports. Mm -hmm. We're like, which passports? And we, did, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know that when you enter the UN, uh -huh. you of course need to bring your ID with mm -hmm. you. And then we called the person who was the head of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. He was this guy from Russia. And then he was literally like almost swearing at us. Mm -hmm. He was like going there. He's like, guys, like, how can you be so <laughs> irresponsible? Yeah. And it was like that year was like, it was so life changing mm -hmm. because I went from the zero to to a hundred basically be, because of that opportunity. So imagine you're from a high school in Uzbekistan and you're in Geneva presenting on the mm -hmm. biggest stage. We literally stood there and there were all sorts of representatives from every country there during the sustainability forum there. So it's not a United Nations model. It's a it's, it's a the, real United it's Nations. The United Nations. Yes, it's the United Nations. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sounds freaking awesome. Yeah, I was just standing there. I was like, "What's going on?" Were there any presidents from different worlds? No, there were no presidents, but there were uh, um, ambassadors from uh -huh. uh, from and Uzbekistan too. Uh -huh. And when they saw us, they were so delighted, and uh -huh. they were like, "Oh my god!" Like we didn't expect Uzbek kids making it here yeah. because we were actually kids. Uh, the youngest person after us was 25, 27. Mm -hmm. And then the oldest was like 50. Mm -hmm. So everyone liked us there. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it was so, so much, so much fun. But the thing is that we made a horrible mistake there. Horrible mistake. And that mistake turned out to be so successful in the end. And what was that? So the thing is that 
it's really funny and it's 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 a bit inappropriate actually but i will i'll take yeah, a risk please, to, you have to, to tell the story you can you cut it out you can cut it out no, after. No, no, no. we have to hear the story guys come on, come on. Uh, you, can, you can cut it out after uh but what happened was the technology that we used to imprint or we proposed to imprint the uh, mm-hmm. seeds into paper mm-hmm. it was called in russian impregnirovanya mm-hmm. and uh what impregnirovanya means is basically imprinting seeds into into mm-hmm. paper so when it came to the name of the project to bring to uh, the UN, we decided to like, okay, impregnirovanya, in English it's impregnation, oh let's just call God. it impregnation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So again, we were 17. Yeah. I didn't even know what that word meant. I, want, <laughs> I wonder what the people's reaction was when you introduced your <laughs> but project. The thing is that for some reason, none of our family members, uh-huh. no one paid attention to that uh-huh. because it's, it, it gets even worse because, <laughs> because it was not just impregnation. It uh-huh. was on a logo. It was impreg and the nation was the, was the capital <laughs> N. Can you imagine? Oh it was God. absolutely horrible. <laughs> it was horrible. And uh, we had like a huge poster. And I think to this day, if you go mm-hmm. to the United Nations Commission uh, Twitter, Oh, hang on a second. You're telling me it's still up there on their website somewhere. You, you can probably, page. if you put like Summer Can College of Light Industry and Economy, yeah. uh, you will find my friend and I standing <laughs> at the UN with a giant poster with a logo that says, says impregnation. Oh my God. <laughs> it's a really well done poster too. I will get, uh, give ourselves we'll credit. We'll look it up for sure. I'm going to look it up. I'll go but and it's look probably it still out there. It, it was ridiculous. So the thing is that uh, there was a part where you presented your project and the part mm-hmm. where you set up like a like a booth kind of situation where you just mm-hmm. told about what you were doing. Mm-hmm. So again, we had no idea what it meant, what the word meant, right? Mm-hmm. And then for some reason, out of the five projects that we're presenting, there were like three amb- amb- ambassadors here, two mm-hmm. ambassadors here, four there. And then there was a whole like, like 50 people near our booth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then they were uh-huh. like, oh yeah, what is that? Uh-huh. What are you guys doing and everything? And I was like, wow, like... Uh-huh. It's, it's, it's incredible that we, our pitch was so mm-hmm. successful that, mm-hmm. you know, people were saying that they came from different departments to, mm-hmm. to see what that impregnation thing mm-hmm. was all about. <laughs> <laughs> that, and then somebody who was so more or less our nice. age there, who was like an intern, and we became friends with yeah. interns there. And uh, they were like, guys, you do know, like a brilliant idea to call mm-hmm. it that way. It's super bold. You mm-hmm. grabbed attention. We're mm-hmm. like, wait, what's so attention grabbing about that? <laughs> and then <laughs> she's like, yeah, just Google it. What it means yeah. and then literally at the UN uh-huh. office I google what the word impregnation means and I'm like oh no <laughs> oh, oh no <laughs> but the 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 fun part like the the the, the good part of the story is that uh, the resolution to it is that we got the last place mm-hmm. in that competition mm-hmm. I mean obviously 17 18 like uh, how much can you mm-hmm. uh, can you do against people one of them uh, one of our competitors was from mm-hmm. Yale by the way I'm good friends uh, not good friends with him but used to be closer now we're still in touch um, and it's, again, it's, it goes to that point where when you do this international um, experiences, you build a network that's uh, just uh, very, very extensive. So um, because we stood out, despite the fact that we got the last place, uh-huh. um, one of the delegations there from a, a Middle Eastern country was like, hey, look, uh, you guys are fun. You guys are young. Mm-hmm. I will invite you to... Uh, this very competitive business accelerator program that uh, was located in Jerusalem. You would just leave there, stay there, fully funded. And they fully, by the way, they fully funded our trip to, mm-hmm. uh, to Switzerland too. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we went there. So it was like the second stage of that thing. Mm-hmm. And I, what I realized is that people who won the competition, they got less money that we got for some mm-hmm. reason, oh, yeah. uh, just because we were younger or whatever. Yeah. So we ended up in Jerusalem learning from ex-vice president of eBay, uh, learning the ropes of business, oh, uh, just being in the middle of the startup scene. Um, yeah. That's, yeah. Just, that's just incredible. That's the wildest story I've ever <laughs> listened to. That's, that's so wild. imagine like next year I applied <laughs> and I had all that to say, including... Yeah that impregnation story. I was very <laughs> open about it. <laughs> yeah. And did, did you actually mention that in your college application essay? I, I don't remember, but if I did, honestly, if a student came up to me right mm-hmm. now, I don't remember, it was eight years ago. I did, re- I, uh, mm-hmm. my entire um, essay was about this one mm-hmm. day at the UN mm-hmm. and just all the learning there when we came in and we were so nervous and when we left it, I almost felt like I was an ambassador there. Mm-hmm. Also because of the, um, guys, you have no idea how, and I look at our Olympians right now, mm-hmm. right? 
And uh, the support that you get from Uzbek ambassadors, from Uzbek uh, community mm -hmm. abroad when you represent your country, I mean, that's the best. Like literally, if you had to pinpoint three, mm -hmm. and I had really incredible experiences, uh, but that would be like, yeah. And then uh, ambassador of Uzbekistan to Switzerland, they drove us to uh, our place. And then we had this mm -hmm. incredible conversation, everything. They were like super proud of us. And we're like, wow, we're representing. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, it was impregnation and all, but <laughs> we did make a very, very good impression on people there. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, when you were done with your extracurriculars, your SATs and IELTS, you applied mm -hmm. to Yale. Yeah, re right? SATs, I improved it to right. 1520. Mm -hmm. uh, I reworked my uh, uh, essays. And again, I went to a person who was a linguist. Mm -hmm. Vladimir Antonovich, again, um, that's a thing, that's my, again, it was in my critique of IELTS. Uh, a lot of top level linguists, the ones who are proper, proper mm -hmm. professors in like, in linguistics, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you will mention any phrase that will be able to give you a live translation without mm -hmm. uh, Googling it. Mm -hmm. uh, true, you know, um, uh, b at the top of their craft. If they took IELTS right now, I doubt they would get nines. Probably not, yeah. yes, probably and not. That's, that's where, again, the mismatch between the English part and the test taking mm -hmm. part. So Vladimir Antonovich, he teaches us, he's knowledgeable in that too, but first and foremost, he's a linguist. Mm -hmm. So he gave me the kinds of insight uh, that I don't think I would be able to get it from, from anywhere who is not this, again, had that proper education mm -hmm. in linguistics. He, uh, the, whatever the story that I present, he did not comment on the story, but he commented on grammar and English and communication. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the lessons that I learned from him, I still carry it with me and I carried it into my college life. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, so once, you, once, you, once, you, once you had your IELTS, SAT and extracurriculars and you got into Yale University, what was your reaction when you mm -hmm. received that acceptance letter? Uh, you would imagine that people, and I saw a lot of people reacting to getting accepted, right? Mm -hmm. And again, for me, it was two years. By that time, I got lots of rejections. I, I never saw an acceptance, and I already knew what to expect, right? Uh, thank you so much. You're incredible. You're smart. You're intelligent. You're mm -hmm. ambitious. But, and then it's like, <laughs> but. <laughs> Everything you say, yeah, 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 yeah. but does, just, not you know, does not yeah, count. Yeah, those, those couples don't count. And then I remember, and it was interesting because it was after Navruz. Uh -huh. And then uh, I represented Armenian Cultural Center in Samarkand. And then uh, our president passed by and mm -hmm. then he shook my hand while he was passing by. Wow. And then I was even joking. I'm like, oh, now like that's the blessing. <laughs> in three days, like after that, it was 24th of, um, uh, 24th of uh, March. Mm -hmm. um, I said uh, 24th of March. Mm -hmm. I received in the morning a letter from Yellen US. And of course, when I read congratulations, I was like, I started like screaming and then mm -hmm. like woke up uh, everyone uh, in, in my family. And then at nighttime, I got admitted to Amherst, mm -hmm. which is this other very, very competitive school. They admit 50 uh, international students every year or something mm -hmm. along those lines. Uh, and then at nighttime, I applied to this MUN contest and for some reason I got rejected. And then they called me and said, hey, look, we made a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, you're actually accepted. So yeah. it was like 24th of March, 2018 was the day for me where a lot of things changed. And then at first you open it and you're like, wow, I, you know, I, I put so, so many sacrifices, so much ridiculing from society, going abroad and then all sorts of experiences there. But then you don't feel excited for too long because immediately you're like, oh, like now visas, now everything, now go like, mm -hmm. it's a different world now. And how do I, I I'm so not prepared for it. I, I literally for a year, I didn't do academics at all. And now mm -hmm. I have to write essays and everything. So it really hits you fast. So getting into university is not the finish line. It, it is it, very much not. The race is just getting started, right? Uh, that's where all your problems start really. <laughs> and it was what, right. six years ago, uh, seven years ago, I received my acceptance uh, or six. So I, I did four years of college and two years I'm out of, mm -hmm. out of college. Um, six years ago. And that's where most, when you look back at admissions, no matter how hard you think it is, your academics and your life there is 10 times harder than that. Mm -hmm. Like, like it's incomparable. And that's what where I'm constantly talking about. Hey guys, IELTS, SAT is sure, but then uh -huh. you have this and extracurriculars and then you, you get your job and, and uh, it, it is a rat race in many ways. Mm -hmm. And then you will need to make choices where, um, you know, that, about 
I, I, I don't want to make a mistake on the percentages, but the majority of students from IVs, they go into consulting and banking mm-hmm. out of all the other fields. Because these jobs are well-paying, they just pay better? Yes. Right. Yes, they're prestigious, they're uh-huh. well-paid. And then you would see people who are like, oh, while they apply, they're like, oh, I want to change the world, I want mm-hmm. to like education, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, I want to do arts. And then by the end of it, they go into Goldman Sachs <laughs> or they go into Bloomberg. Right. Most of my friends from Singapore, they work in those kinds of companies. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them are happy, but I would say most of them, they understand that they're taking sacrifices right now so that in the, like, that's the thing. It's like, when you start this process, always delayed gratification. Mm-hmm. So it's like, look, some in the future, in the future, in the future, in the future. And sometimes the promise is that sometime when you're 45 or 50, you just sit there and, and you sit on your millions and you can enjoy your life. Mm-hmm. That's not the kind of lifestyle that I ever wanted for myself. And typically people who do that, they're the ones who care about grades. They're the ones who are like super competitive and I want to win everyone in everything. I just don't think it's the most mature approach to life. Mm-hmm. So that's why when I got into college, I was like, you guys do you. Mm-hmm. You can do your academics. You can like fight within your own like whatever inner mm-hmm. uh, competitions and case studies and everything. I would do my, my own thing. And then a lot of people were saying, how, how are you going to find a job in Singapore? Mm-hmm. Like, how do how you like, because unlike Yale, uh, when you sign a contract with Yale and US, we had to stay in Singapore uh, for three years and be employed by a Singapore company. Yeah, And then again, that's why most of the people, even bigger incentive for people from Yale and US to study, uh, to uh, go into consulting and banking because those are the ones that will hire you. My approach was I want to build Freshman Academy to the point where I can start a company in Singapore and hire myself. Mm -hmm. And when I came with that plan to um, people in my college who are responsible for, uh, I guess, like professional development, they all said that this is highly unlikely, don't do that, it's highly risky, borderline impossible. Now I'm two years in Singapore. Uh, Freshman is a Singapore business, Singapore-based business. I ended up, I managed to to hire myself there. So it all played out. I'm not saying that Mm -hmm. do that, but I'm saying that in my case, I just didn't see myself working 12, 14 hours per day and, uh, you know, putting papers from one uh, part of the desk to another, which of course it's uh, diminishing the impact of those kinds of works are incredibly, and you need to be incredibly smart to do most Mm -hmm. of it, but then that's, the very caricature view as an entrepreneur that I had on that uh, on that field, and uh, yeah, so so that's why I was very averse to going there. But moments, days, years leading up to building Freshman Academy, uh, what was your time in Yale University like? Mm-hmm. Like, so you studied liberal arts. Yeah, I mean, yield, right? yeah, I mean, let's let's talk about liberal arts because many yeah. people think liberal arts has but, but something but to do. Before we talk about that, like, yeah. would you like to elaborate on also why you you know made that choice? Is that simply because you didn't want to pursue the same path as your friends who were who went down the path of banking and yeah. finances? Because why did I choose to, to do liberal arts? Yeah, yeah. Uh, li- liberal arts is something that uh, you don't have a choice. If you if you study at Harvard, you study liberal arts, uh-huh. regardless of of the, your major. Right. That's very, so liberal arts is not, it can mean two things. It can mean specific majors. Mm-hmm. We typically refer to majors that are more in the humanities, social sciences realm. Like literature. Yes. Philosophy. philosophy and history. And so on. I see. Or liberal arts can refer to a system of education. Mm-hmm. So liberal arts as a system of education, that is something that I studied. Mm-hmm. Um, what is it, right? And th- this is something that will be, your, your viewers will find very interesting because I doubt that with all this talk about Harvard and Yale and whatever, Mm -hmm. very few people still know about liberal arts, which is ridiculous because ultimately that's the core philosophy of education in those places. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean? Um, The education that you got exposed to and most people in Uzbekistan the post of it got exposed to is a post-industrial European education where the purpose was to produce an employee who would work at the plant or who would work in the organization. Typically, the kind of majors that that includes would include uh, would be accounting, would be uh, mm, more practically oriented ones like marketing. Uh, do you know that there's no business major in at Har- Harvard? Yeah. yeah. Vlad de Grad. Did you hear that? that that's shocking. There's no, there's that's no shocking. business major. Uh, but how about, how about Harvard Business? Harvard, they, Harvard they, Business they, School is for graduate students. Uh-huh. Is but there's not no for undergraduate. undergraduate. There's no undergraduate, and at Stanford too, mm-hmm. by the way. And why is that? Um, the reason why they don't have those programs is because they follow liberal arts system that takes its root in Greek system. Mm. 
mm-hmm. where the goal was not to produce a person who would be working in a system, uh, but a good citizen. Mm-hmm. So what a good citizen should do? A good citizen should understand how to analyze arguments, how to communicate, how to um, use math to, let's say, build a house. So it's more foundational kinds of fields. So liberal arts focuses on those more foundational uh, experiences of what it means to be a human, what it means to be a thinking being, as opposed to what it means to be an employee in the company. Mm, or just a cog in the machine, right? Yes, yes. Uh, and that's why liberal arts students are often ridiculed for not having the practical skills that students, let's say, the UK universities uh, have uh, and, and build. Uh, typically, practical skills, you're meant to develop them on your own or through clubs or through some classes in, in college that are practically oriented. But that's not ultimately the purpose of education. The purpose of education is that you become a good citizen for your country. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Business, it's the uh, very recent major that in itself you can deconstruct it into psychology, into mathematics, into philosophy, into this, this, and that. Uh, The first business degree was at Wharton School, that one of very few Ivy League universities that have undergraduate business degrees, but they're extremely competitive, Mm -hmm. and understandably so. But it was somewhere around 19th century. So what Harvard and Yale and, and other top universities are saying is that Look, there's no, not enough of critical knowledge base for us to teach you guys for four years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like that's the message. Right. Uh, you, you can study it on your own. You can do two years and that would be enough. You can build upon your liberal arts experience and core, but ultimately that's, that's the difference. I, I know some people from liberal arts system, um, let's say my very, very good friend uh, from uh, Austria, Bulgaria, uh, yeah. Uh, so he studied the same major as I did, which is pol- uh, politics, philosophy, and economics. And then after college, he went into um, uh, aviation consulting. And his close experience to uh, aviation consulting before was he probably took like planes, you know, to different places that mm-hmm. he went to. Yeah. What liberal arts gives you is this ability to go into, to delve into almost any topic and mm-hmm. become knowledgeable in it. Um, yeah, because you're good at understanding arguments. Yes, right? you're because you read a ton arguments. of papers and you read a, right. uh, read a ton of papers. You uh, through different. Mm-hmm. Let's say you can have a class that one of the classes that I could take in college is Korean um, sitcoms, like a whole class on Korean sitcoms. Ooh. And you be like, it doesn't make sense. Like, why would you teach Korean sitcoms uh-huh. to people who are supposed to like lead the world politically and economically mm-hmm. or whatever? The reason why you do that is that you take this as a topic and then you study literature, you study philosophy, you study psychology through Korean sitcoms. Mm-hmm. So you take that as a theme and then you sort of apply that critical thinking or you, uh, better, you learn that critical thinking through a specific mm-hmm. uh, example of Korean sitcoms. I had a co- whole class dedicated to Socrates' death, mm-hmm. death of, uh, of Socrates, a whole class. Half a year we studied Socrates. But then what you learn is not just Socrates. You, you learn stuff about life. You learn stuff about philosophy. You learn mm-hmm. stuff about uh, historical patterns. You, you learn so much. Uh, I, I did a whole class on uh, Amarna letters, which were letters from the Bronze Age mm-hmm. that uh, different kings wrote to each other. So that's the foundation of basically global affairs. Mm-hmm. And then you could track, for example, one king writing to another um, was, you know, saying things that then there's no historical evidence for. So that's how we can learn that they were lying to one another. Mm -hmm. Or uh, for example, you had this big empire and then one region asked from the king some support because they were attacked. Mm -hmm. And we know from historical evidence they were never attacked. Mm -hmm. So he was lying to amass these resources and topple the king in return. You learn all of these fascinating things. Mm -hmm. And I understand it's a privilege, of course, and those institutions are elitist because ultimately who has the resources and time to delve into those topics, mm-hmm. which will, most people need to work to just make their uh, you know, ends meet. Right, right. So uh, I actually had this conversation with Dean of Yale College, Pericles Lewis. I, I sent you the, the video where I confront, confronted him uh, uh, you know, through all of these problems. Mm-hmm. And then he gave very convincing replies to most of the 
uh, you know, most of the concerns that I had. And then I found that Yale developed this strategy for till 2028. And then it was after our interview. Um, and then a lot of the concerns that I shared in the interview, they were reflected in that paper that uh -huh. Yale uh, wrote on, okay, we are seen as elitist, we're seen as this and that, and diversity and so on. We can talk about that too. But I was very glad that we, we are on the same page, uh, Dean Pericles and me, in terms of understanding the challenges and the benefits of that kind of education. Right. So the liberal arts don't teach you what to think, but rather how to think. Absolutely. Right. So put it in simple words. Absolutely. So that's why when people are, uh, and we had this conversation with you mm -hmm. before, right, where, um, you know, people there, after getting exposed to that kind of education, it does not mean that you will become liberal after that. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people after that kind of education become super conservative. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the running mates of uh, Trump, he graduated from Yale. Mm -hmm. um, basically the entire political elite, no matter, uh, or most of the political elite in the US, they're coming from that kind of liberal arts background. They, yeah, even my pr professors, oftentimes I would ask them, what do you think? And then they would say, sorry, mm -hmm. I can't tell you. That's not the point. The point is not what I think. The point is, I will give you the evidence and then you can make your own decision, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's oftentimes is what's infuriating about liberal arts education is that very rarely you're given answers to things. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, it depends. And then like, they just give you a whole map of studying something and then you're on your own to make your own opinions from that. It's, it's, it's a fascinating system. I think, again, when we talk about Harvard, Yale in the, edu in the Uzbek educational context, even in Kazakh one where we work with Kazakh students, some of the top Kazakh students, Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools used to send, uh, send uh, uh, kids into Harvard and Yale way before Uzbekistan, and we started it here, way before. And even now, not many of them know about liberal arts. Yeah, my purpose is that people don't just get admitted into schools. They get admitted there and then they thrive there. Mm -hmm. They flourish with, and they know exactly what they're signing up for. It's not for everyone. Mm -hmm. It's not for everyone. Some people just want to do accounting and they want to do, let's say, I don't know, they want to do uh, architecture, engineering. They want, they want to do something tangible and practical. And we cannot criticize them for that. For that. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, liberal arts students... Uh, there's like a joke, like how many liberal arts students are needed to like change a light, bu a light bulb in the room, <laughs> right? <laughs> like I'll do with all these people, yeah. uh, like we would not have all that. But um, if we're talking about pushing society forward, right, there's this 5% or 10% of people who challenge uh, the way we think about economics, mm -hmm. uh, about politics, mm -hmm. about that systems level view. That's something that liberal arts is f absolutely phenomenal yeah. in. And one of the, aside from that, one of the biggest criticism of actually, so here I, I'm trying just to play, trying to play the devil's advocate here. Yeah, of course. One of the yes, criticism sir. I heard of liberal arts is it's at the time, at this point in history, particularly being sort of imbued with mm -hmm. woke ideology, mm -hmm. like things like gender studies. Right, mm. trying teaching kids that there is more than two genders, yeah. or things like you know transgenderism. Yeah, and so what's your take on that, really? Like because oh, I think it's one of the one of the, yeah, one of the yeah one of the yeah <laughs> it's that's the, actually one of the things uh, that's so off putting mm. students find off putting mm. coming from especially conservative background, mm. right? Yeah. and that might be one of the reasons why s very few students go into social studies, social sciences. Mm -hmm. is, is it the alternative for liberal arts or do they mean different things? Uh, uh, lib again, uh, if, even if you study physics, mm -hmm. you're still within the liberal arts system. Yeah. So if you go to Harvard and you think that you can just yeah, like focus on, you know, technical aspect of education and just forget about all the activism and, uh, and that part, part of work, mm -hmm. um, it's impossible. Right. Or it's, I guess, it's, it's possible for some people, but um, I, it means that you will need to fend yourself off certain groups and then mm -hmm. you would not be able to get like a full experience of what it means like to study there. Mm -hmm. So can you just completely sit in your room and then cram like on your, and then completely forget that there's like the outside world was uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, what, uh, how you described it, like Vogue uh, ideology and all that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's possible. So when we work with students, uh, mm -hmm. oftentimes we're saying, hey, look, you need to know what you're signing up for. <laughs> um, yeah. But that's 
I mean, there are a lot of points. I studied this uh, for so long. I experienced it myself. Because if you come from Samarkand, and you can imagine the kind of use that I had at the time, and then you go into an environment of where freedom is the chief value, and then people pursue value, uh, pursue freedom in so many different ways, I felt very out of place uh, mm -hmm. there. So maybe in the Samarkand standard, I was not the most conservative, not, not the most liberal. I was somewhere, I was, I was a centrist. And there I was, the, I was like the biggest conservative at Yale and US. And then uh, I was very vocal about it. And the good thing about my approach was that I actually sat down and spoke with people. I didn't think that they're crazy, that mm. they're just nuts, that they're, uh, because they're incredibly smart people. Mm. Like to me, the question was, what is going on here? that I don't understand because I knew that they were really smart and like, are they pretending? Are they like, what's, what's happening? And then what I learned in this four years transformed a lot uh, of my very superficial view of that whole ideological stage that we're at because that's changing. It's not like, you know, it's fixed and then it will forever be like that. Um, what we're having now is, is a reactionary ideology. I mean, do we want to go there? Like we, we can turn it into a political, into a, a politics I mean, podcast. I mean, sure, too. Since we start digging down this rabbit hole, we might as well get to the bottom of it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, look, um, there's this, uh, book called the ethics of authenticity mm -hmm. by Charles Taylor. If you want to truly understand, what a modern Western ideology is, start there, start with that book. Mm -hmm. And what that book is saying, and it was written in the 90s, it's saying that uh, individualism has become a root, like a core ideology in, in the West. So uh, individualism presupposes freedoms from oppression, ultimately, right? Because you're an individual, and that there are the social structures that put you and tell you who you are and how do you behave and, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Individual is saying that, hey, look, we want to be free from that, free from social structures. Mm -hmm. I can give you an example. I identify as an Uzbek person. I lived in Uzbekistan, I understand Uzbek culture, I understand, I know Uzbek history. It just happened so, and it's very, very unfortunate that I happen to know, not know Uzbek language, which is something that I'm fixing right now. Uh, some people in Uzbekistan might be telling me that, hey, look, and by the word Uzbek, I mean the way how uh, in the West they understand, you know, not just ethnicity, but sort of where you're coming from, what do you represent? Uh, then some people might come to me and say, hey, you're not, because you are, you know, not speaking the language. Um, what the Vogue or whatever the liberal culture would, uh, uh, culture would tell you is that you have the power to disregard that because you feel like it. And I mean, look at my case, right? I represent Uzbekistan on, on so many different platforms. I bring um, investors uh, to Uzbekistan. I establish connections. I hope to become a bridge of Uzbekistan to the South Side world. Yes, I don't know the Uzbek language, just like a lot of Uzbeks ethnically who identify as Uzbek, but still, you know, uh, that is something that I want to be empowered. I, I would want to empower myself to view myself in the way that I want it mm -hmm. to be. So it's, it's a deeply empowering ideology at its very core. But what happens next is that you start delving into, let's say, gender. And then gender is also one of those social constructs where, uh, let's say, give a definition of gender. Let's say women are those that uh, reproduce. You know, If you can give birth to a, a, a kid, then you are a woman. Uh, you probably know of that recent, very recent case of two athletes from, uh, from the Olympiad who a lot of people call transgender, but they were actually born women and they had this mutation uh, that increased their testosterone. They can actually give birth to children, mm -hmm. but they just have very, very high levels of testosterone. Uh, the conservative view of that would be, oh, you're still a man like because you have high testosterone and because, yeah. But then the... A liberal view on that would be, hey, look, uh, you were born a woman, and yes, you deviate from the, what, I guess, like that definition, but then you are a woman, ultimately. Like, even within that definition, you can carve out a way to, uh, to defend that and say, hey, look, how are they responsible for being born with that, um, uh, you know, high levels of testosterone? They can give birth. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they are uh, women by, by all accounts. So what... That what what started there is now is getting into this extreme where I can identify with anything, mm -hmm. and then Charles Taylor in the 1990s was talking about that, and there were cases where you know um, uh, in the prison in the UK or something along those lines, 
uh, a guy said, "Hey, I identify as a as a kid," and then they would like give him like uh, you know, <laughs> like that's the extremes of that ideology of empowerment of you versus social structure, mm -hmm. and it's the same that I'm sure all of your viewers identify with, which is. You are your own individual with your own views and your own beliefs. And then we have certain ways of looking at things where like, okay, you need to believe in this way because you are that. Uh, all right. So we're talking about studying liberal arts, right? Mm -hmm. And so how would you say your experience of going to Yale University was social side of things? Like we talked a lot academics, mm -hmm. right? So did you do anything in the way of social life? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was very reflective mm -hmm. of the essay that I wrote mm -hmm. in my essay, Position Myself, which I truly was and am as an entrepreneur. So I uh, revived Entrepreneurship Club that mm -hmm. was long uh, forgotten at Yale and US at that mm -hmm. time. For a few years, it was inactive. Uh, then um, I get to know a bunch of people from lots mm -hmm. of different countries. Um, what else? Yeah, I mean... Do you guys have parties at Yale? Um, Yale, Yale... Uh, in the US, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was a different kind of experience uh, compared to what it is in Singapore. Uh, Singapore, th there were some restrictions. Uh, so for example, you obviously would not see uh, something like drugs at the US, which is something that you might see on campuses in the US. Mm -hmm. um, then, uh, uh, yeah, we had parties, of course. I don't think they were nearly as crazy as Yale ones. Uh -huh. I don't know if Rustam went into it, but, um, and again, I, I will be very open here. And if, if I did it, I would let you know. I'm, in general, I, I prefer to stick to truth no matter how uh, <laughs> self, uh, you know, and I did tell you that impregnation story and all. <laughs> uh, there, are, uh, there is this common historical, I would say, experience of having naked parties at Yale. Mm -hmm. It's where every, like, like literally, I don't know, you have a hundred people and they're all completely naked in that's the same room. That's wild. That's and I had, insane. I never had a chance to do a semester abroad there, uh -huh. which if I did, I don't know if I would, like, I mean, that sounds crazy, right? But then, and it's very interesting that you would imagine that to be a uh -huh. sort of tense moment, but then uh -huh. apparently people get used to it really fast mm -hmm. and then it's like, that's it, it's fine. That's just crazy. Uh, it's it's crazy. I mean, let's, let's talk about that, guys, when we talk about Yale and Harvard and uh -huh. Stanford, right? But at the same time, it's not like you have to do these things, but uh, you might do these things if you mm -hmm. want to, I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. if, if, if you're into it. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly at Yale and US, uh, we did not have most of, of that craziness of the mm -hmm. American campus, maybe for good, ultimately. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the social life at Yale and US was academics, ultimately. So people staying in their rooms, studying, studying, studying. So mm -hmm. it was like Yale on steroids academically. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we did have parties. Usually they were smaller scale in our dorms. Th the one thing that's different between uh, how Yale and US and local unis treat their students is that Yale and US and Yale, they treat students as adults. So we could literally bring people into our dorm without anyone checking who that person is. Mm -hmm. So like it was not uh, really rare how after a party, my friends... I would like tag someone along and then you go into the common room and then there's some like random person, like some mm -hmm. random banker that they mm -hmm. met like yesterday and mm -hmm. they were partying like somewhere. You guys just don't sleeping have, there. You guys don't have any security or something? Uh, security is very, like good security is the one that you don't notice. Uh -huh. So there are cameras everywhere. If something goes off, like mm -hmm. you would have a whole like... Uh, I don't know. I mean, you yeah. you have people to support you. Because what if one of those days a guy brings with him a friend who might be carrying a bomb? Right? Aren't you guys? Afraid? I'm in Singapore too. It's the yeah. realities of Singapore. I guess uh -huh. Yale in the U.S. You have a lot more security. You have like mm -hmm. a Yale Police, which is like its own small military unit. Mm -hmm. So uh, Yale in the U.S. and Yale in Singapore, those were very different experiences. So Yale in Singapore, security and everything was very. Uh, like you would not notice it sort of there are cameras there are everything mm -hmm. if something goes off you have a whole like group mm -hmm. coming and uh, resolving the situation I see. but it's, it was so safe in Singapore is so safe I once left my wallet like it was maybe not a wallet but something really valuable maybe it was actually a wallet but some people did leave wallets like in the and then you would go um, on a week abroad you would come back and it would still be there 
But it was, again, in the context of yelling, it was being closed. You could only, like, tap to get in, and uh, you have cameras. So you'd be crazy to steal something in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, you know, again, we're talking about systems here. When we talk about, oh, Singapore culture is, you know, uh, following the rules, being, um, you know, uh, criminal levels are very, very low. Part of it is Singapore culture, but part of it is the system in which it evolved, which is you have cameras almost everywhere, you have a strong economy, so you don't need to steal stuff. And then now uh, when you, you're in Singapore, you're like, oh yeah, Singaporeans are this, this and that. But it has not always been like that in a sense, right? So again, going back to this like social construction versus reality, that reality, that system created a certain approach to, uh, to life. So yeah. Yeah, so it was super safe. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So upon graduating Yale University, um, so when did you exactly like found the freshman academy? Like how did this... It like, was so uh, when, second when semester ha- of my second year. Right. Yeah. And before I just, I mean, I could open uh-huh. it earlier, but I was like, I don't think I'm ready. It's, it's, it's such a big challenge. It's such a big responsibility. I just mm-hmm. don't, I don't think I'm ready for that challenge. So um, for the first year and a half, I was just focusing mm-hmm. on my academics. And did it some, is it something that came, were you doing it as a side activity, like a side hustle, or is it something that came from passion? Uh, no, passion, 100%. Mm-hmm. And, and everything that we have right now is the vision that I thought about back in the day. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but I, I thought that we would get there much later. Mm-hmm. I thought it would probably take five years just to get the first IV student. We did it in the second year of our operation. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I thought it would take at least five years. And because how- again, back in the day, it was back, in Uzbekistan, there was a view that they don't admit Uzbek students from public schools. So you guys are breaking stereotypes. Yeah, everyone's like, hey, from TIS, uh, uh-huh. it's very rarely that it happens. From a public school in Uzbekistan, you want to prepare someone for Yale? Mm-hmm. That's crazy. <laughs> and then I was telling students that, like Umid, when he applied first, Umid mm-hmm. was the first student, and Rustam, and then we had Murad. You really need to meet Murad, by the way. Mm-hmm. He is one of the most fascinating students. Mm-hmm. In, uh, he's coming from a background where he lived in Jazakh, and then he lived in Bahmal, which is a village in Jazakh. And then he didn't have, have internet access for most of his life. And then at some point in his life, there was internet access, but he literally had to climb on a tree to get access to the internet. And then this guy, he, um, with the help of his local, local English teacher, and then with the help of um, you know, some resources that he still had, he gets a scholarship at a school uh, in uh, Tashkent. Uh, I believe uh, it should be uh, CIC. And then things parallelly worked for him. So he joined freshman as he gained access to the internet. Uh, he studied in Tashkent already. And then he became super interested in artificial intelligence on a very, very high level. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, okay, uh, Murad, I will send you. And I took a class at college uh, called consciousness. It was all about the nature of consciousness. We can uh, talk about that too. So it's uh, for half a year, I studied consciousness and what it means and, and mm-hmm. so on. So then I sent him all the materials. In two months, he becomes a better, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've never been an expert in that, but he becomes more knowledgeable in this field than me. And then he goes into computer science. Mm-hmm. And then philosophy of consciousness, computer science, artificial intelligence. And with that background, he applies to Yale. And then Yale admits him from that kind of background. Wow. It's, just, it's, just, it's just insane. Absolutely insane. Um, I mean, that's ultimately what I want to do because when I was at Yale and US, Yale and Yale and US was much better at it than Yale is still, even though Yale, outs, like if you compare to other IVs, Yale is the most diverse one in a sense of there are kids of billionaires studying with, the, with kids from public school from Uzbekistan. Mm-hmm. Let's say Umid, he was in the same class with Jeff Bezos' son, our first student. What? Yeah. Are you, like you said Jeff Bezos' Jeff, son. Jeff Bezos' son. Yeah. And they, they go to the same class. They, they were in the same That's... class and they were like interacting. He has like his phone <laughs> number. He can call Jeff Bezos on anytime he wants. It's that kind of level. Wow. Uh, and Th- then, this guy went from climbing trees in a village to going to school in the same class with Jeff Bezos' well, son. Murad, That's I, just... I probably, Murad was not in the same class as Jeff Bezos' son. Umit was, uh-huh. to, to, but he's in the same college. He uh-huh. can interact with him all he wants. Um, he, and, and, and Jeff Bezos' son is just one of many, many mm-hmm. people there that are very, very high level. Uh, but then, yeah, 
it's it's for mm-hmm. me my passion is that can we bring our kids who know Uzbek culture are really down to earth and down to the roots of what it means to be Uzbek instead of just taking someone from like a private school who uh, never had that much of interaction oftentimes was uh, regular I guess folks from 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 our country mm-hmm. for me it was a big social experiment that I and it and it does work mm-hmm. we found like in almost every um, university, top university in the US right now, there are Central Asian clubs. The first ever Central Asian club at Yale was founded by Umid and Rustam. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he talked about that. And then they brought uh, the first talk that they had, uh, one of the first two talks, they brought Ambassador of Uzbekistan to Yale to speak at Yale. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's the vision. It- and then when we started freshman, it started just with SAT mm-hmm. classes, but then in my mind, that's what I wanted to build. Mm-hmm. Because everyone is talking about SATs and IELTS and whatever. That's my passion. That's what I want to do, which is, has nothing to do with IELTS or SAT mm-hmm. or even university education uh, in, by and large, because all of those are tools to get somewhere. Now let's start talking, where do you want to get, right? In the case of Rustam, it was, uh, ameliorate the environmental catastrophe that is the RLC. In the case of uh, Murad, initially it was, and of course it, it also changes, and, but that's something that they start with. For Murad, it was genuine passion and connection was what, it, what, what consciousness constitutes and computer science when he uh, applied uh, for Yale. That, that is something that I'm passionate about. Like, what do you guys want? Do you actually need Yale or Harvard to get there? And let us create an environment where you guys get there, not just get into Yale or Harvard, because mm-hmm. all of those are just tools to, to realize your ultimate vision. I just really wonder what you teach these guys. Like, what's your curriculum like? Mm. Where do you get those textbooks? And mm. do they actually get taught textbooks? Or are they just being yeah. told to read some random books? Yeah. So how do you go about the logistics of writing a curriculum that would cater yeah. to the needs of highly intelligent students like them. Yeah, so we have this uh, program called admissions program. Mm-hmm. And I, it's not just me, so we have two leading people in the freshman group. So it's me and Dr. Luciana. Mm-hmm. So Dr. Luciana, she's a Virginia Tech professor who worked at equivalent of Crimson in Brazil. Mm-hmm. Crimson is this world renowned company. I, ultimately, if we're talking companies, there are probably three or four that know IV admissions. In in I, I would, argue in maybe post-Soviet, maybe there are five. And then Crimson is one of them. I, I would, again, I'm biased, of course, but I think objectively speaking, freshman has earned its way uh, as we had four years of students getting admitted into IVs, four straight straight years where students got admitted. But um, so uh, Luciana often has a, an option to work for those companies, but she really likes the vision and the, the passion that we have for, for mm-hmm. the work. So she teaches political science, and then together with her, we developed a curriculum where you go all the way from understanding liberal arts to understanding writing on a very, very deep level. You understand research, and uh, you understand the admissions uh, mm-hmm. in terms of the practicality of it. Mm-hmm. So, and then we supplement it with readings, we have seminars, the curriculum itself is all our experience of studying in those places, reading a lot, and I mean it, a lot, a lot. And then for every book that we assign, we read about 10 books uh, to assign uh, this one. But, but see, like the thing is that even if you have that curriculum, you need people who will be able to teach it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and these people are very high up there. Their alternative costs are very high, meaning that instead of doing this, they could work at Goldman Sachs. They could write, write research for governmental organization. They could do all sorts of things. And Luciana, uh, she does do that. She works in a, a university, and for her, it's sort of a side thing that she does. And she's from post-Soviet space herself, working with Uzbek students, Kazakh students, Russian students, um, is something that she just finds infinitely more gratifying than yeah, I, I think if she wanted to make millions on, the, uh, on this, she would probably be able to do so. Mm-hmm. And same for freshmen, to be honest. Uh, we have cases where uh, parents come to us and say, we have unlimited resources, unlimited. We, we can literally start a startup for our kid. Mm-hmm. And we say, hey, look, we talk with the kid and then they're not really that interested in this whole thing. We're like, hey, look, money is not an issue here. We just, we have very limited resources. We cannot, like no matter how much you pay us, we had cases where, uh, like, and I heard about those uh, cases with, with other teachers who did 
um, work within that space, people offer them like supercars. Like, oh, if you can get my, my kid into Harvard, I will buy you like a Ferrari or something. Like full on, like that kind of discussion. And then uh, oftentimes you just sit there and you're like, hey, it doesn't work like that, unfortunately. Like if we could, like mm. we, <laughs> we would mm -hmm. like, but if you're not in a certain mental academic position to apply there, um, there's no, actually there is some amount of money and if you have any of your viewers who are coming from the kind of families that can donate 10 million dollars to Harvard, mm -hmm. I can guys like honestly find a way to connect you with people there <laughs> who can officially do the donation and then it can actually boost your admissions chances. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're starting to talk about that from like tens of millions of dollars, you know, f five at least or 10 and, mm. and whatever, whatever. But it's, you're still not getting a guaranteed seat, even if you're paying uh, I assume that even though they don't say that they mm -hmm. do, I mean, if you accept like a 10 million <laughs> donation from, <Right. laughs> I assume that it's pretty much guaranteed, but I assume also that they also talk with the student mm -hmm. so that they don't admit someone who will just be depressed. Like they, mm -hmm. there needs to be some minimum level. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at the stats, like there are some kids who get admitted to Harvard was like 1350 or something as on the SATs. Mm -hmm. You're like, who are those guys too? Um, some of it is also that they have APs or IBs to compensate for that, but some of it is uh, uh, people who donate and, and fund those. Because it totally makes sense. I mean, $10 million, that's like, you, you can pay for 25, around 25 kids, or like even, wait, $20 million, you divide that by 400,000. Yeah, so, you get so it's 50 kids. 50, yeah. 50 kids. 50. So you can get one who would pay their way in, right? Of course it doesn't work uh, like that because they sometimes fund research programs for specific, not just you know paying for school, but whatever. Um, and then you have 50 students that study there totally for free for four years. Yeah, half a million dollar education. So that's how it works. And you guys are online, right? Your operations. From the beginning, from, from 2019. The, and are you guys, do you guys want to one day sort of settle down, have your own base, like have your own headquarters? In Singapore, no. In Singapore. Yeah. Uh, you, you, just, you just can't find the kind of people that we need here. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no one who we see as, or at least maybe our students, who not only are knowledgeable more or less in the process, which is something that you almost cannot find anywhere, mm -hmm. but also knows freshman's approach, mm -hmm. which is very different from, from right. the way people work anywhere. Because ultimately when we built freshman, I did not look purposefully into what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, let me just rely on my own experience and let's just see what was all the cultural exposure that I had, experiential uh, exposure that I had at uh, the UN, uh, network connections, people here, deep rootedness into Samarkand, into Tashkent now very much so. Can I do it our own way? And then like, again, even if all the, I, I don't think freshman program can be taught by anyone outside of freshman mm -hmm. because it's just, or they will need to be trained so hard and now we're trying to get people in and they're super knowledgeable, but then we need to like introduce them into the freshman approach. That's very, very different. So, so how would you define the freshman approach? Like what's the philosophy behind being a freshman? Mm. Or if I wanted to apply for a job at yeah. your place, yeah. so would I qualify? What would I need to qualify? Uh, I, I think that, I mean, on the English front, of course, mm -hmm. like there's no questions, questions there. Uh, on the writing front, uh, how good you are, let's say, was creative writing, was mm -hmm. writing narratives outside of, mm -hmm. outside of IELTS. How good you are was writing research papers. Mm -hmm. did, did you write uh, research papers that were, that were on the level that the universities, such as Yale or Harvard, would accept? Because uh, whatever I saw that West, Westminster does, it's good, but it's not, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not there. I think academics are, uh, yeah. Um, I think in your case, and again, just knowing you, per, like just for a mm -hmm. day, uh, I, I don't think it would take you too long, but let's say two, two, three years of being in that environment, working with different kind of kids, maybe working for free first. And yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's years of work. Right. It's clearly years because ultimately it's one thing that I'm telling you what it feels like. It's mm -hmm. another thing that you will need to feel those things. You need to actually see it. And then mm -hmm. I would say the biggest challenge would be the cultural. 
because you'll need to not only know English, know research and be rigorous and then writing like and all of that, but you will need to understand how our cultural points will land there with admissions officers that oftentimes are students of those very institutions. Mm -hmm. So you, you see there's a lot. So when I say that some of our people in the global market, they could get, get paid $200 per hour, that's factual. Mm -hmm. Because to get the people who studied there, phenomenal English level, research skills, ability to communicate with students, uh, de delve deeper into their story, explain them how they can present their stories. Uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of package where you would not go into admissions if you knew that. Mm -hmm. You would not do admissions, realistically yeah. speaking. You would do something else. Because the opportunity cost is too big, like yeah, you said, and, right? And, and frankly, in my case, I don't want to do admissions all my life. Mm -hmm. I want to do it, let's say, till I'm st like 30 years old. Mm -hmm. And then I hope to go into something more tangible. And I don't want to go into politics as I'm like a front person, but I want to do, let's say, research papers for decision makers. That's something I'm very, very passionate about. Hopefully mm -hmm. at some point, based on freshman or outside, my vision is to build a company that uh, does policy making for countries you know how uh, uzbekistan already does it but then we typically invite let's say something like mckinsey or something like deloitte to help us build our economic um decision making or uh, and and we made tremendous progress with that mm -hmm. but i was just i was just thinking that to work in that kind of uh, or uh potentially in uh in political campaigns so when politicians run they have people who study their biography, write speeches based on that. They capture a specific style. They build a voice. It's the it's very very similar to what we're doing right now mm -hmm. with students. But just for us, public is not our um, audience, but it's just one or two or three or four admissions officers initially, and then they bring right. it up to the big committee there. So it's a very similar approach. So you want to do it on a much bigger scale eventually as a lobbyist, as a uh, potentially that kind of work, yeah. Right. Like even uh, certain countries in the U.S., mm -hmm. they have their repre representative offices in in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, lobbying lobbying groups. I would like why not work in Uzbek lobby and then mm -hmm. promote uh, Uzbek view of the world and then Uzbekistan's interests in the mm -hmm. U.S. or in some other countries. Uh, but again, of course, a lot of it is uh, very dark. I would want to do that if I were to do that, you know, transparently, openly, uh, positively. And that's a very, that's very much Uzbek approach, by the way, uh, approach where you're non-political, you're talk about the you know what's at hand, what's the matter at hand, and you're just very very productive, mm -hmm. and you don't delve into all of this like mm -hmm. politics or whatever. We're very very good at that, at just being practical. So mm -hmm. I would want to be that sort of practical lobbyist on behalf of our country. But again, it's one of the those kinds of things that I hope to be doing, mm -hmm. not helping kids get admitted into unis mm -hmm. in let's say 10 years. If I, if I still do that in 10 years, I would take that as a probably, you know, that uh, maybe I need to switch into something else. But mm -hmm. I, it's, not, it's not that I love doing it, it's just that, uh, not, uh, not love doing it, it's just that I think I would want to grow further from that. Right. You ever thought about the occupational hazard of being a lobbyist or an intellectual, right? Being oh, yeah, outspo of outspoken of and, you know, being honest and transparent about all these different issues, which sometimes might actually get you in big yeah. trouble. Yeah, right? I, mean, I mean, look. Because uh, I looked, sure. at, looked at your interview with a guy who's into Russian. Yeah. I mean, we can, we you, can go right? about, like, yeah, we can go so into that. So you too. said that his daughter almost got assassinated. Not almost, she got. She got assassinated. Yeah. So the guy who you're talking about, his name is Alexander Dugin. Uh -huh. And uh, so what happened was in 2021, again, liberal arts education, right? Mm -hmm. I started noticing in the Russian speaking world that there are some ideological changes that are happening. S certain points that are, that, are, that are pushed that maybe regular people did not understand or did not see or didn't notice. But then... I started noticing them, certain preparation for something. And then when I started to collect, and I collect a lot of evidence and a lot of, all tentacles of that led to one person. And that person is Alexander Dugin in Russia. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so that person, and by the way, he just had Alexander Dugin was invited on Tucker Carlson podcast and stuff like that. Wow. So, so imagine the level, right? <laughs> the level was very, 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 very high, but the guy's extremely controversial. Is very, he's, he, be, he became very popular in the conservative circles because he pushes the position that conservative circles in the U.S. Um, are some parts of the conservative circles they resonate with. So, but my job was not even that. My job was to understand what what's going on in our region. What's 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 that ideological preparation that's that's happening? Uh, and I read his books, and then uh, we will not go in, into this. I mean, it's a whole thing, uh, right? Uh, and that I studied uh, quite quite well for years, basically. Uh, now. Uh, and uh, I just messaged him. I said, hey, look, I'm a Yale U.S. student uh, from Uzbekistan who wants to talk to you in English because I think your opinions uh, on the role of Russia in the global system, uh, on uh, sort of cultural influence of Russia, of his argument is that Russia is its own civilization. There's like a Russian Eurasianist civilization between Asia and, and Europe. Uh, I, I would consider him a person who I disagree profoundly with. But then I still, uh, profoundly on, on many points, profoundly. And we can go into that. I don't know if we would want to. But then I wanted to invite him precisely because of that. Because I so deeply disagreed with him. So what happened was on campus, there were U- Ukrainian students who I became very good friends. One of them actually was in Uzbekistan, very, very good friends with. The way I portrayed that interview, I, I wanted to make it as neutral as possible because that's how I am. Was even with the most, uh, you know, uh, I interact with all sorts of radical people. It's all rel- uh, relative, uh, and when I say radical people, uh, it's on the right, on the left, just in day-to-day conversations. And for me, your politics, your world worldview is one. Again, you're human to me first, and I just want to understand where your ideas are coming from. So. I uh, uh, put like a poster and everything, and it was like, oh, he's a professor at Fudan University and blah, blah, blah. So I took most of the information from Russian Wikipedia. And then my American friends who never even knew, or Western friends who never even knew who this guy was, started to read English Wikipedia. And then on the English Wikipedia, it says that he's basically a neo-Nazi guy who is uh, like a Russian uh, neo-Nazi person. Uh, And by the way, both of those accounts are true. He, he is a uh, Fudan prof who is actually, you know, with some of his ideas that are extremely, I find extremely biased and uh, whatever. Um, uh, he's an intellectual that influenced R- Russian policy quite a bit. I sat down with him, uh, spoke. It had a crazy backlash in my college. People called me all sorts of things. Um, but then I talked with my Ukrainian friends about how to mitigate the situation. I re- read a disclaimer, uh, wrote a disclaimer and saying that, hey guys, he is a contentious individual. He's a controversial individual that has controversial views. My goal is not to give him a platform. That that was their view, right? That was their critique. It's like, oh, you're giving a platform to basically this really dangerous person. I'm like, hey, there's something that's going on. We need to study this. And uh, it was interesting because in a year, uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, war, start. war starts, yeah, and yeah, but of course, uh, my Ukrainian friends would say that this ideological built up was much earlier, and I agree with them uh, that it was much, and much, much would, earlier. Would you take away from that interview? Would you realize upon your conversation with that guy? Uh, n- n- never, never argue with people who have borderline religious views mm-hmm. because uh, there's science and there is religion. And then religion is something that you hold deeply to your heart. It's deeply personal to you. It's the kind of perspectives that you never wish, like you, you never wish to let go. And it's mm-hmm. fine. Mm-hmm. I think that the, his way of, uh, you know, uh, his uh, borderline, I would say, those kinds of views, mm-hmm. kinds of views, they infiltrated into his social sciences. And uh, that's where my, and I can give you a specific example of that. So one of his views is that any Central Asian person can become a a part of what he calls Russian civilization, right? So if you want to be a part of it, you learn the language, you start like doing literature, whatever, you become a part of this very inclusive, you know, civilization that is Russian civilization. The the problem there is that uh, there was this Tajik singer who represented Russia in the Eurovisions. Mm-hmm. And then she uh, studied in Russia. She was, by all accounts, a part of that, what, what he calls Russian civilization. She represented Russian Eurovision, and then her song was very progressive, very liberal. 
And then uh, my critique of uh, Dugin was, look, is she a part of Russian civilization? Does she have a right to shape what Russian civilization is? Or you're just supposed to be a recipient, you know, of that inclusive, you're just a part of it, and then you're sort of, you're supposed to follow whatever you say, whatever we say you should follow. Then it's not inclusive, ultimately. So I don't think that his argument holds that Russian civilization, unless, un, un, unlike European one, that is very expansive, that uh, aims to conquer you, subjugate you, change your opinions, change your beliefs, change your view of yourself, that Russian civilization, and I mean, we can look also into um, our history with the Russian Empire that is full of counter arguments to what mm -hmm. Dugin is saying. It's mm -hmm. not like we wanted to be a part of it, right, ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, but, but a lot of what he's saying is uh, very interesting, and I agree with it. But see, that's the thing. It's like, do I agree with him with the main points? Absolutely not. But let's say when his view is that technology is developing at such a fast pace, fast pace that, um, I mean, it's not his view, he adopted this view into his theory, that it goes exponential to the point where we might create something that will destroy us. So we're actively on the path to self-destruction. Isn't that what AI is? Yeah. No, it's, yeah, I mean, I mean, AI, actually, I mean, that would be a superficial view of AI. AI is nowhere close true consciousness, and we mm -hmm. can talk about that. It's just a mathematical model. And again, mm -hmm. as someone who didn't study AI uh, in a focused way, we could, we could have this whole discussion too. But uh, this view is very, very interesting. And then, but the thing is that he uses that view to justify that, oh, Russia is not backwards, really. Mm -hmm. Russia is like, Russia is the only country in the Western world right now that wants to stop that madness that European capitalism is, that is just, you know, more, higher GDP, more, 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 and then it's destroying the planet and, and so on and so forth. So, like, see, uh, he taught me something. Do I, do I agree with him? Absolutely not. Um, on a, I, I would say something that's uh, very, you know, um, controversial perhaps, perhaps, but no matter how I disagree with him, he has... I, I would argue, destructive influence overall in the post-Soviet space. Would I want to have a conversation with him uh, and then try to push up again and maybe convince him against some of, but again, I don't think it's possible even, so I take it back. I don't, I don't think it's even possible because his view is so deeply entrenched. I don't think it's even possible. Yeah, but it is what it is. I, I, I did that. Uh, what I learned is that uh, Singapore Ministry of Foreign Affairs joined some people there, mm -hmm. maybe not the top people, but some of the people working there and studying Russia, they joined that interview. Mm -hmm. Some of the professors at Yale and US, they said, hey, look, what you did, ultimately the way you portrayed the interview, it was not ideal. You should have put the disclaimer knowing how contentious she is. Uh, he is. I agree with that. Uh, but at the same time, they're like, it was bold and it was really courageous of you to do that, knowing that people will be going after you. Yeah, I had situations where even my friends would be like, mm -hmm. not like not talking with me, but they, they, there was a little strong like tension because on campus for like two days, people thought that I'm giving a platform to some very dangerous person, which uh, ultimately I explained, I became friends with a lot of these people. That's the price that you pay for delving into very challenging, very challenging topics and very dangerous topics, yeah. Very, very dangerous topics. So why do it all that? Are you just doing it for personal curiosity? I, I just, uh, for me, there are consecutive circles. So there's Samarkand, there's Uzbekistan, there's Central Asia, and there's the post-Soviet space. Mm -hmm. So to me, I'm equally interested in all the stages when it comes to uh, so sociopolitics, uh, socioeconomic uh, status of our countries, when it comes to development, uh, when it comes to all sorts of things. So that's something that I've always been passionate, uh, I've always been passionate about. So that's just my, my, my curiosity, and that's it. There's, no, there's nothing more to it. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a pity that I can't see that interview because it was a live interview, right? It was so, a live interview on so it's, Instagram. It's gone now. Yeah, and yeah. the traditional is that uh, Alexander Dugin is, mm -hmm. his Instagram was not up, up to date. So, and it's, it's so ironic because his argument mm -hmm. is that even the fact that we did it on Instagram was mm -hmm. ridiculous in itself because the person is against technology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, yeah, but the thing yeah. is that while I was doing that interview, and that's where I knew that I'm doing something really interesting. I had like all the comments and then the English speaking comments criticized me and then the Russian speaking comments criticized me. Mm -hmm. So I somehow managed to bring these camps together with both of them hating on us doing it this way. 
because it's like, oh, you are a Russian speaking person. Why are you like speaking this Anglo Saxon, whatever, you know, language and why you are. Uh, and then my American friends, of course, they were very, very concerned about all the repercussions of inviting such a dangerous person who was, he was described as brain of Putin, mm -hmm. which some people think is overblown. I think that he is uh, like, when you look into modern prop propaganda in Russia, he was very much at the ideologically at the core of it. And then it's interesting that my diploma work, it is based on that interview, it's based on that. And then if you talk with um, both sides of the aisle, they would both agree with me. If like my professor in the uni, he agreed with my research argument. And uh, some of my friends who um, are from a different camp, mm -hmm. they agreed with, with it too, which again means that I was able to represent both cases in a way that they both like, okay, that's us. That's not strawmanning the argument. That's not representing something that we don't stick by. So that's my, in the long term, if you look at the philosophy of what I'm doing, that's what I'm trying to do. In the world that's becoming so polarized, in the world that's becoming, you know, where conservative media is taking one case of, you know, some crazy liberal extremism and then presents that the entire movement is like that. And then the liberal camp looks at, you know, our countries and then goes into some, also outdated traditions that we all have, uh, and then says that, oh, all Uzbek culture is like that, all Central Asian culture is like that. Both are wrong. I mean, let's just first understand what's, I would, like, what do we represent first? Let's just sit there, and we're not that different what you would realize. And if you were born in that camp, if you had like some crazy uncle who like, in, you know, injected those ideas in you, you would probably think that way, and then the same story was that. So my, my, uh, long-term vision is, is unified people as much as possible b through that humanist, and I understand it might sound naive, probably it is naive, and that's why all long-term no, visions altruistic. are, it's uh, but it, it's just that I, I, I hope that I back it up with like evidence, mm -hmm. I actually do it, you know, like bringing someone from Uzbekistan from a village to Yale, mm -hmm. right? Uh, bringing um, uh, I'm, I'm English-speaking people on a meeting with like a guy who was named the brain of Putin and who drives uh, Russia's policies right now. And then, I mean, imagine if these people listened, truly, truly listened to what he's saying. They would really understand what Russia is up to right now. Like, like they would really, truly understand at the core what are some of the concerns of uh, the modern Russian state beyond uh, all the atrocities that it commits, which, you know, uh, is something that we can argue is factual. So let's go beyond that and see on the other side, you know, if, if that's also the case. I mean, U.S. Ha has its fair share of, uh, let's say, invasion of Iraq that was mm -hmm. unjustified. And I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's the thing. I, I approach it with a more social scientist perspective rather than someone who is... Uh, who takes this or that side, which sometimes you need to, of course, because uh, you need to defend certain sides that are obviously in the right. Um, but yeah. Wow. That's just a lot to take in. All I can say, okay, I'm just sitting down here and trying to process all this information because I never really thought about things this way, right? And you're just giving me a breakdown of different viewpoints on both camps. It, which made, which is making me realize it's really important we have more of these conversations, like you said, yeah. and be good listeners and sit down and just give the other person the benefit benefit of the doubt yeah. and try to understand their reasoning where they're coming from, right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But but again, when we use the word matrix, and a lot mm -hmm. of especially male students, mm -hmm. uh, they approach me as that, like, what is matrix? How I define matrix? Mm -hmm. Matrix is any social structure, including the one uh, the one that you're in right now, mm -hmm. and then your confidence in whatever views that you hold. It's the same like interpretation of reality that might not be fully reflective of, of the truth. My advice is go and talk with people who are different from you, mm -hmm. and not just like. Talk with them to be like, you know, like when people sit and listen and then they're like, oh, let me just confront, confront, confront. Mm -hmm. But like genuinely understand where they're coming from. Even if you're opposed that view, even if you want that, whatever they are up for to end, you would better understand where they're coming from. So you'll have a better toolkit to actually address it rather mm -hmm. than to just go out there, misrepresent their view. Mm -hmm. And then you have parallel discussions where you're not even mm -hmm. understanding each other. You're just completely and a lot of it is politics frankly there's yeah. political interest there is a, a very like in politics one of the biggest tools is to turn one group of people against the other that's how you can manage 
Yeah. Large groups of people, you take one, you give them an identity. Okay, they are the ones, they're the problem. Mm -hmm. Let's, you know, and then ultimately that's what's happening. Yeah. If you look into some of the worst atrocities in the world, you know, and how they were perpetuated, it was the same kind of toolkit. You take a group of people and then you take some of the most atrocious maybe manifestations of their culture, whatever. You represent it as definitional to what their culture represents, which is often not the case. And then you're like, oh, uh, you know, they're the, 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 they're the reason you have all these problems. You know, they're the reasons why you are poor. They're the reasons why you are uh, missing, not like you're mm -hmm. not acknowledged, unacknowledged or whatever. And then that's how you control people. And that's my argument ultimately. Right. In essence, divide and conquer. Yeah, divide, divide and, and conquer. conquer. Like create, a, create an image of, a, of an enemy and then that's the best way to put people together. And uh, who do you think is behind all this right now? All right, before you answer that question, I really want to make sure Mike is yeah. picking up. Hey, buddy, yeah. Mike, Mike is working, right? Please, yeah. yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So who do you think is behind all this right now? Uh, it, th there are all sorts of forces behind mm -hmm. behind this. Just like historically, there has been. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not major news. I mean, mm -hmm. look at the. Again, if you want to understand what's happening right now, look at what what happened in the past. There were all sorts of groups, all sorts of interests, uh, economic interests, political interests that drive, uh, you know, uh, ideation, I ideology in certain directions, mm -hmm. having certain interests in mind. It's it's not. Like people again take like oh there's a conspiracy there's like black rock or whatever there is or like deep this, state. this deep state right all of that is is the result of the system and how it works mm -hmm. historically not like you cannot blame if you let's say the the most influential people in the world right now you take them you take all their power all their wealth you redistribute it right to people in ten twenty years you will have new uh, inf like new influences, new people who are doing things behind closed doors, new contestations and, and mm -hmm. all, all of that. I think of it as, as more of a systemic thing of how the world works, which a lot of people, by the way, on the liberal side, they think that we can fix that. Mm -hmm. On the liberal side. On the liberal side, they're like, oh, there are all this like, if, if you look into who criticizes um, corporations, it's typically people on the liberal side, not people on the right, right? Mm -hmm. It's people on the liberal side who say, hey, look, they are. They have power that's unchecked. They have, and we need to diminish their power. We need to redistribute, blah blah blah. And then, uh, yeah, I don't know how realistic is that. Maybe with a different kind of system, system of coordinates, technology, or whatever, that would change. But I don't see how that can be can be ameliorated right mm -hmm. now, fixed. I just think it's just it's just kind of. A, I don't like nationalist arguments are not popular among social scientists, but uh, it's kind of a sort of, I see it as some, something that's not just natural. Yeah. And sometimes all these viewpoints and ideologies sort of get entangled mm. and you have a whole different set of mess, whole different problem. Because so you, on one side, you got liberals saying that we need to take down big corporations. On the other side, you got conservatives saying that big corporations, the reason why the economy still exists yeah. and we have people... Different arguments though, right. but they can have... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's that's the thing also. The political system of coordinates where you think you're liberal or whatever conservative, it's very, very difficult to figure out. Mm -hmm. uh, like most people have a very superficial view. They think, oh, it's so simple, right? Mm -hmm. If you're like pro-family, uh, you are, let's say, what would you say? If you're pro-family, you're what? A good person? Uh, no, no. Uh, are you conservative or you're liberal if yeah. you're pro-family? Pro-family. Conservative, yeah. for sure. No, yes. but but the problem is that how conservatives are pro-family on the one hand mm -hmm. and a capitalist on the other hand, mostly. So they're saying, oh, you know, uh, the the number one reason why is family st uh, structure or like a big reason. Okay, I will not say number one, but the big one is capitalism, where you have a, a hu like husband who needs to work. 12 hours per day in some like corporate job. You have a mom who also needs to work. Nobody's like, uh, it's capitalism that do does that. It's capitalism that, that really undermines family values in many ways. Uh, and it's socialism on the liberal side that like, okay, let's redistribute resources. One of the biggest liberal ideas is that liberal insights is this. Look, people were working 12 hour days 2000 years ago in the field. And even then they probably didn't work 12 hour days. Now with all this technology, with all the development, people are still working 12 hour days. Does it make sense, really? Does it make sense? Maybe there's a way in which we redistribute, re, uh, redistribute or distribute resources that's wrong and that really is detrimental 
to families that need to like, like look at the capitalist structure, it's survivalism basically. Like you wake up and you like survive. Even if you have everything, even if you like, we have food, we have like now everything is available to you, but still you wake up and it's like in the back in the jungles or something, right? And again, I'm more pro-capitalist, but you need to uh, very freshly look at capitalism, understand how to reform it, how to make it better or whatever. But you, you cannot just say, oh, this does not exist mm -hmm. ultimately, right? It does exist. Um, it does exist. So see what, what I mean, pro-family, capitalist, right? And then pro-society and social bonds, anti-family left, mm -hmm. uh, sort of, right? Like, is that how we need to differentiate the two? I mean, it doesn't make sense to you. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, read Ethics of Authenticity by Charles Taylor. Mm -hmm. It's all there. In the 90s, he predicted we'll be in, in that, in the situation. Like, he, li he describes what we have right now. And then our parents, probably grandparents, never even thought this would be even the case, right? That will be in the world that we're right now. This person, again, how did he do that? Social scientist, unbiased review of what's going on and then basing his analysis. That's what liberal arts allows you to do. You just see more things. And when people are saying, oh, liberal arts, money, 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 pay on the... What I think I have right now that most people don't have who didn't go through that system is that you feel about the world differently. It's like I give this metaphor of going to a museum and then writing a reflection after, after you went to a museum. If you know the ex exposition, if you know the different exhibits, you go outside of that museum and you sit down and you're like, wow, there's so much that I observed there. I studied this for years. And you write like a whole pamphlet with, or a whole like essay or research paper. Imagine you go into a museum and you don't know much. You go out, you're like, oh, yeah, there was some, like, a plate there. There was some table from, like, 15th century. Like, there was some... That's how people are in society, where if you don't know those social, I guess, concepts, uh, social sciences concepts, you go around the world thinking that it's so simple. Oh, it's just a Chinese table from 15th century, you know? Oh, it's just, like, whatever. And then because everyone is like that, then you bounce back the same very clear-cut, simple arguments about the world. Oh, the world is really simple, you know. We are Uzbekistan who are, you know, conservative, and then we have traditional values, and then the West is all, like, rotten to its core or whatever. But wait a second. Let's look into the best period of our life, like, our, uh, our development. Let's look into, um, let's say, Jadid, Jadid's movement that we had. Where did this guy study? What were their ideas? They were very progressive. Look into uh, why uh, Islamic world in the golden age of science was so, you know, scientific progress. And then uh, even philosophy, I told you about it, that Western, even Western secularism has its roots in Islamic ideas. There's this person, uh, Ibn Rushd, and all of you can, can find it mm -hmm. online. Ibn Rushd was very much is an Islamic scholar. And then he founded what you right now call, or I mean, you, I guess, people who call uh, sort of Western ideas, whatever. He founded something that eventually led to Europe that we see it right now. So the world is a lot more complex, but then you cannot lead people with that. You can't be like, okay, guys, you know, it's actually a lot, like, it's very, very complex. You need people to go out there and fight. You need to be people to go out there and, produce and do something and like, and for that you need very, very simple uh, statements. Like go, go to any political rally. Mm -hmm. Do you think they will have like a lecture on <laughs> social science, like whatever? Mm -hmm. They'll exactly, be like, oh yeah. yeah guys, like who are we? Where this, what do we represent? Or we represent that. Make right? America great again. Yeah, yeah, make America great again, right? <laughs> uh, that's, yeah. But then my question is, do these guys know what they're saying is simplistic? My argument is that absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because where did they study? They oftentimes they studied in the same kinds of systems mm -hmm. that argued against that, but they know the reality of the situation to control people, to manage people. You need simple things. You talk with all of the, those politicians, they know, like whatever I'm sharing with you, they studied that themselves. We all, if we were to speak with them, we would find that common ground, but then they can still do this atrocious whatever because they know that the reality of the system is this. You cannot, you will bore people to death with your discussions on, uh, yeah. And that's why I don't want to make Freshman Academy popular. That was never a goal. Because that's uh, so counterintuitive. Yeah, I don't want to make it popular. And I'll explain you why. We were actually a lot more popular in 2020, 2021, 
compared to what we're at right now. What happened as freshmen became popular, we uh, be started to get approached by students who were not in the position to apply to places like Harvard or Yale or whatever, but they would ask us questions such as like, oh, can I get admitted to Harvard with like IELTS 5.5, <laughs> right? In your dreams. Yeah, I mean, uh, like That's... those were, kind of, and again, I don't blame the guys, right? I mean, they were just entering yes. the field, whereas we realized that we don't want to be popular. Mm -hmm. We want to be popular among a certain group of students for whom whatever I'm saying right now mm -hmm. would land and they would at least understand where I'm coming from with this. And I don't remember last time anyone asked me that question. Mm -hmm. Because when people get into freshmen, they're the ones who know exactly what they're signing up for. It's dreaming big. It's understanding the world is very, very complex. It's a being open-minded, understanding that ultimately there's this humanist core to all of us and to our view of the world. And that uh, you want to, like you're really young and then you're not really aware how ignorant you are about a lot of things. Let's go out there and let's explore and let's study and let's bring back and then make Uzbekistan great, um, right? Uh, that's, if, if I, I were to like pin down what's freshman's approach, it's that and then it's incredible people on both ends. It's incredible students and it's incredible teaching staff uh, that all studied more or less in the same system, that know how that works, that uh, are very transparent about all the challenges uh, and you know um, the limitations of that system. It's not a perfect system like, like I'm telling you. So yeah, so, so that's the magic of what we're doing, I guess. And, mm -hmm. and I, don't, I don't plan to be popular, uh, I wish, that I am popular among, and that's already the case, let's say, in Nazarbayev schools, in presidential schools, and Nazarbayev to a lesser extent, but even uh, from there we have uh, students in presidential schools. People who are well positioned for admissions tend to know about freshmen, and there is a reason, there is a reason for that. Because our audience is not the kind of audience that you would collect in political rallies. Our audience is 5% of the, of the people who are like, hey, I'm just a bit skeptical about how things work, but I'm not that radical to like think that or just go in any like radical direction. I just want to study. Like, let's see what's going on. What? Let's see what's up. And then disciplined academically, blah blah. blah. It's 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 that kind of that kind of student that we work with typically. You would so you talk with Rustam. Yeah. You would talk with uh, Murad. You would talk with Parizod. You will talk with Guzal Khan. You will talk with um, Frangis uh, uh, from Stanford. You would talk to a lot of these guys. You would find that there's something very deeply different about them. And it's not just, again, there is a treatment effect and there is a selection effect. And maybe we can talk about that too. Oh, for sure. We need to get into that because um, one of the things I had in mind is, mm -hmm. so would you not say the success of your program is the fact that you are very selective when it comes yes. to who you teach, who you guide, who you mentor? Yeah. Right. So, uh, let is me it, Which is very reminiscent of the Harvard style yeah. admission, right? Yeah. It, it, it's quite interesting. I always had that question. And then I looked into it at, at its very core when we just started out. Did we have a privilege of selecting students? Absolutely not. Umid uh, Usmanov, who got admitted to Yale, I know him since the time he was like 13, basically. Mm -hmm. So there was no selection there. It was like whoever was around, and then we were helping those, those students. So I know that the treatment effect is very much there, and also they know it, because they come one, one kind of uh, like people when they join, and then they, when they leave, they're a lot more mature about their choices, a lot more, um, yeah, a lot more, just a lot more mature academically, personally, professionally, because there's network also. We try to connect them with, you know, different organizations and help them get um, uh, internships and teach them how to use LinkedIn and, and so on and so forth. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very big process. But now we also have a benefit of a selection effect. So now it works in both ways. But uh, do you know about the famous study of Harvard students and how much they make? Uh, no, no, not exactly. Doing light so, me. so it was, it was a study um, in the beginning of the 2000s or even in the 1990s where they did a brilliant thing. And, and now we're, we're going into actually research methodology and the proper research methodology. So what they did was, the question that they asked was this. Is Harvard responsible for the salaries that its students make? Is it Harvard's effect or it's something else? What they did was they looked at two groups of students. One group of students got admitted to Harvard and went on to pursue education at Harvard. The other group of students got admitted to Harvard also, but they decided to go somewhere else. So in terms of getting admitted to Harvard, that was similar. And then in terms of 
uh, going to Harvard and not going to Harvard, that was that was different. Mm-hmm. So they could actually track the effect, not of the selection process, but the effect of the treatment effect. They could single it out basically through that process. What they found is that people who got admitted to Harvard and went on to go to Harvard um, did not make much more money than people who got me to Harvard and went on to study at Westminster, let's say. Mm-hmm. So what it says is that it's it's not really as much of Harvard's effect as much as they admit successful students already. Right. Yeah. So it, the school is not really worth the hype. You can actually go to a different school and still be, become I would, successful. I would argue so. I would, I would argue so. Of course, there is something that Harvard and Yale can give you mm-hmm. that no other public school, like and just the resources and everything. Or the but ultimately, wise. if you if you were to ask, is it the people? Or is it the resources? So my argument is that it's the people. It's you and your power and your skill and your knowledge and your open-mindedness and so on and so forth. Because those are the things how they accept students in the first place. So when we admit people into freshmen, we also use the same kinds of metrics, ultimately, that Harvard uses in, in admitting those students. So, yeah. But uh, Harvard also admits mostly students who did IBs, who are academically strong and everything. Freshman's case is very, very different. We need to work with cultural incompatibilities. I, I would argue that freshman's treatment effect as of now is much stronger. As you, let's say, would go into private schools, I, I think our treatment effect will be much weaker there. Mm-hmm. But with the current group of people that we work with, treatment effect is massive. Absolutely. And, and that's why ultimately, if you look into who in Uzbekistan prepares, genuinely prepares students to get admitted into like really good schools, a lot of them uh, interacted with freshmen in some way, either were students or were a part, or are a part of uh, alumni network or yeah. So who genuinely had, of course, there's a whole, we can all discuss like the admissions, um, mm-hmm the admission scene in general and how it became very info businessy, how there are all sorts of claims that are being made that are untrue, how it all reduces to like, oh yeah, just take this exams or like, like there's a lot of nonsense that's uh, happening in the admissions field as it always happened. I mean, it's not the first year or the last year that we would experience that, but ultimately uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, uh, there is a big correlation between somehow being affiliated with freshmen and being prepared for college, not just getting in, but being prepared and being mature. Are you considering, you know, one day having your own, you know, headquarters or your school somewhere here in Uzbekistan, Tashkent or Samarkand? No. Right. No. So why do you think it's not the wisest thing to do? Uh, I like the fact that I can uh, focus on other schools and work with some of the best students in each school, mm-hmm. as opposed to, let's say, if you open the school here, then uh, in Bukhara, let's say, a physical school, then you will, be con- uh, you, you will be limited to some of the smartest kids in that area, which is my goal is to work with some of the smartest kids in the world, ultimately. Mm-hmm. So that's my, that's, that's my vision. Uh, but do I think that this work needs to be done, of course, and that like, the treatment effect on the larger scale needs to happen? Absolutely. I just don't think it's for me. And then again, as I try to phase out from that field in the long term, I would want to work with masters, with PhDs, with uh, mm-hmm. on like those kinds of cases, rather than go back to um, high school. Because if you work with, uh, and I don't know if you would, uh, um, I, I think what you're doing is absolutely incredible. Because when I speak with you, I mean your level of English is, I mean it's not that I'm, I'm judging, but uh, judging it, but it's. Uh, uh, it's on par with anything that you would get in any of the top universities. Uh, given that you mostly interact with students who probably have a much lower level of English than you. And I mean, even if you compared that, grammatically our speeches, I'm sure that you would probably find more mistakes in mine than in yours, which, which gives a sense to me that you very intentionally improve yourself in the context where most people would not be able to improve in the first place. So I, I, I honestly, I have no idea how you do that. It's, that's it's, that, that, it's that's actually one of the parts, hardest parts of my you know, job, I, I coming to the classroom <laughs> and being able to sort of dumb things down. Yeah. And I know it kind of takes a toll on my own uh, skills as well. Yeah. But so I, I just wear different hats when I'm in the classroom. I yeah. just try to be a little down to earth and try to relate to my students. Right mm. when when I'm having a podcast, though, I have to wear a different ca- hat, yeah, different exactly. cap. Exactly. So so that's sort of that. This is how I you know see myself. I think 
you know, flexible. I said like fluid identity, and that's what I think of fluid mm-hmm. identity as being able being to be different, different, you know, people, and, mm-hmm. and different space and time. Yeah. So it's something I've learned from having being involved in business. Like when yeah. when you're in business, you're talking to uh, like people who don't who don't who never had education, right? To yeah. renovate your building, you're talking to people who. Yeah. who had part of the education, they had high school education or undergraduate education. So, so you just realize that the world is a different place and just try being open-minded and, and try toning down a little when you're talking to you know, people who, are, uh, who don't get things right away. And right. when it comes to intellectuals such as you, then you try to up your game a little so you can keep up, <laughs> right? So it's just a game of balancing things, yeah. right? Yeah. Something I'm still working on, still work in progress. But again, so. fascinating. I don't, I don't think I would yeah. be able to do what you're doing yeah. uh, in terms of mm-hmm. just creating a kind of carving out a space for yourself where you strive for excellence in an environment where there are not that many people who are better than you, mm-hmm. which is very, very important for me. Like yeah. if, if I am in a space where I feel like that's why I want to go to Singapore. Like mm-hmm. people are like, oh, if, if you like Uzbekistan so much, why are you not staying here? The answer is that it's just really easy here yeah. for me in my space. Like right. if I were in a different space that would be more competitive, I would love to. But just like the best people in my field, they're located there. I would want to, you know, compete with them. And now we're opening hopefully an office in Singapore. Mm-hmm. And then I would want to compete with the best of the best of Singapore so that we can bring this best knowledge to Uzbekistan. And I would ultimately want if Freshman goes global ever, mm-hmm. that's a deeply Uzbek product at its core was how, again, when we talk about Uzbek culture, how accepting it is, how it was on the, and, and even I can f- single out in many ways, Samarkand culture that is uh, on the trade route, that diversity that Samarkand people uh, genuinely interacted with firsthand for centuries. And that it, it requires you to be inclusive in the sense how American universities understand it too. Um, that's at the very core of what freshman is ultimately. If you look into academia, let's say Mirzo Lugbeg, did Mirzo Lugbeg, um, uh, you know, did all of his incredible research that 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 he that he did based because he wanted to get like some score on the exam, or because he he wanted to become uh, and make a lot of money? I don't think so. He just did it because he was interested in, because he had questions about how world operates that he did not find answers. He could have, I'm, I'm pretty sure he probably could find some answers uh, from some wise people around him. They would say, oh yeah, these are just like dots of like whatever. And then they would just explain it somehow in their own way. But then he was probably skeptical about it, right? And I mean, at that time, by the way, uh, like people, uh, and it's very interesting to what extent they knew about star systems and everything. I don't think they thought on such a low level as I just presented. Uh, it was it was a much, but I would assume that he went there because he was not satisfied with the answers that were available to him around him. And then he, uh, Mirzol Beck is world renowned. I think people don't really understand and underestimate how our figures or say, do you know where the word algorithm is coming from? Probably you don't know. Me. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. And then, uh, uh, th- these are people who at the time were progressive. I mean, y- look, in Europe, f- for saying that the world is a, is a sphere, you could have died there, literally. Mm-hmm. And then here we knew about it all along. So uh, isn't it what being progressive is at the time? Like, just again, let's revert ourselves back there. Like, do you think that the West or the East or like us were more progressive in a sense of ex- kind of exploring different possibilities, going against status quo? I would argue we were more progressive mm-hmm. back in the day. You're I right. would argue that. And even, even the position of women there and, and here, a uh, position of, yeah, you can look into all sorts of metrics and you can make an argument that uh, there were some periods in our development where we were like leading the way and then really going against status quo. And um, yeah. Right. For the first Renaissance actually took place in the Middle East, right? Not, the, not Europe. Unlike what most people uh, the think. early one, the redis- yeah, Ibn Rushd, the one who rediscovered, I mean, Ibn Rushd, redis- like Renaissance is rediscovering works of Aristotle, mm-hmm. works of uh, the Greek. So it's so fascinating how for centuries all of that got lost through the conquest and everything. Um, and then it resurfaced. And then that resurfacing was in many ways facilitated by Islamic scholars. One mm-hmm. of them was Ibn Rushd. And Ibn Rushd was probably 
one of the, if not the first one, I mean, one of the first ones for sure. I wouldn't say the first one, but one of the first ones. Yeah. And how do you think the Renaissance happens? Like there are a lot of theories about how Renaissance starts, right? Mm. Yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of crazy theories. One of them says it was because of, of the discovery of coffee, which, which mm. contains caffeine, it's a stimulant mm. that makes you just sharp yeah. and yeah. focused and start thinking linear way, coherently, right? And then, then you start doing science and poetry yeah. and all that. <laughs> And it's also interesting that it coincided with the onset, onset of a religious, religious spread like that happened in the Muslim, the, the Islam, the spread of Islam into the into Middle East and then the other parts of the world. So mm. as to what do we, would you attribute that Renaissance period? How do you think it came about? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I didn't study it, so mm -hmm. I cannot authoritatively uh, mm -hmm. say um, uh, I think it's a good place to talk about correlation versus causation. Mm -hmm. uh, did you hear that uh, postulate before? It, it's again... Sort of, yeah. Yeah, so, so what it means is that there are things that might be correlated, but it doesn't mean that one thing causes the other. Mm -hmm. So let's take an example of computer games. Mm -hmm. So you play computer games and then you're violent, Right. And then you would observe data and it would be like violence of in kids and then playing, let's say, shooter games. And then you'd be like, oh, it's clear that, you know, games that involve violence make people more violent. So this is correlation, essentially. And then you're making a causal argument that one thing actually influences the other. But what you often find in, in science is that things don't work as, sim as simple as you may, th as you may, th uh, you may think. What uh, in reality happens is that people who are predisposed to violence choose to play shooter games. So it's the other way around, what, what's mm -hmm. called reverse causality. So that correlation that you observed, it did not necessarily lead to a causal argument. Mm -hmm. We need to teach that thing at schools. Right. Because oftentimes when some politician come, comes about with some graph or whatever, right, and they're like, oh yeah, look, things make total sense. You know, one thing influences the other. Uh, maybe you can pull up to your uh, audience, and maybe you can do it right now. Yeah, sure. Correlation between eating chocolate, and um, it's one of the classic examples from social sciences. Eating chocolate and Nobel Prize laureates. Yeah, let's see what the internet says. And guys, please, can we turn down that, turn down that AC? It's getting cold here. <laughs> I'm literally freezing. Or set it to, set it to fan mode. So correlate. Hmm? It is at fan mode, right? Yeah. Are you sure though? It says 20. The correlation between eating chocolate and Nobel... No, Nobel Prize yeah. winners. Do you see the graph? So the... Chocolate uh -huh. uh, consumption and uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, yeah, I found it. So it shows different countries. So R is 0 0.791. And probably no, no just, just again, you don't need all these numbers. Yeah. Just look at the graph. Uh -huh. So you can see, and probably we can, can we put it actually uh, For somewhere? sure, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So what you can see is that countries that consume more chocolate, mm -hmm. they have more Nobel Prize winners. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Like Switzerland is the top. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you got Sweden. Yeah. You got mostly European countries. But, but now, now let's approach mm -hmm. that with, again, with the IELTS sort of perspective mm -hmm. of analyzing graphs, right? Mm -hmm. What would be some, something that would, you would deduce there? You would probably say, as the graph, mm -hmm. uh, as the consumption of chocolate increases, mm -hmm. you get more Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> Therefore, yeah. chocolate makes you smarter, right? Yeah. Something along those lines. The problem is that this is a classic example of what we call in social science, Emitted an emitted variable. Mm -hmm. So there's some other variable that actually influences both the consumption of chocolate and Nobel Prize winners. What do you think that variable can be? Is there dietary preferences? Uh, no, not in the realm of dietary preferences. Mm -hmm. Actually, something very, very different from either of those things. What? Okay, let's start with this. What influences chocolate consumption? What kind of product that cho like chocolate is? Coca chocolate Coca Coca Yes. Yeah, but right. is, it, is it something that, let's say, if you're coming from an uh, underprivileged background, do you eat a lot of chocolate typically? No, not exactly. Yeah, so yeah, chocolate is a privilege, right? Uh -huh. So typically chocolate is consumed in countries that are richer, economically more developed. 
Now let, let's look at Nobel Prize winners. Uh, can you, let's say, if you are in a country with a very low GDP, very low development, right? Do you think you'll have many Nobel Prize winners? You will not have, you will not have research uh, institutes, you will not have all. So economic development influences both chocolate and Nobel Prize winners. So it's not that the chocolate you know, is correlated with uh, Nobel Prize winners, but it's just chocolate is correlated with economic development. The more economic development you have, the more chocolate you eat. And then Nobel Prize winners is also correlated with economic development. The more economically developed you are, the more Nobel Pri Prize winners would you have. So that graph is actually extremely confusing mm -hmm. in telling you, like some people would actually make a decision of eating more chocolate based on that, but there is nothing less uh, true about it. So when I say uh, critical thinking, when I say specific approaches to that, that's exactly what I mean. I mean, can you imagine how many correlation and causation arguments can you make in the Uzbek context? What we tell each other all like every day, how many fallacies that we have, some, how many biases we have, how many logical misinterpretations that we have. Uh, even some of the professors in our college, they studied things for 30 years. And sometimes we could find some mistakes in their logic, in their, very rarely it happened, but still it happened. If those people who studied, and they didn't study economics, they studied one like subsection of economics for 30 years, and they made mistakes there. What do you think, you coming out of like high school, right, who doesn't even have like four years of college, what do you think you, you have in terms of the kind of logic and soundness of your arguments? It's not very like most of the things that you believe in is probably wrong mm -hmm. yeah in such a such a scenario so again that's yeah i'm, I'm trying to again yes. what i'm trying to do right now guys I'm, I'm putting literally everything that i learned in like four years here <laughs> right yeah 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 stuff like that uh, this is this is by the way this is basics mm -hmm. and we can go into like the more advanced stuff and that would require a lot more time and a lot more but that's where you start Th that mm -hmm. was like a couple of months into my college experience Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, are there any like books you'd recommend, you'd suggest people watching this podcast if they want to get started on critical mm -hmm. thinking? You, you uh, think they should be reading? I would get back to you on that. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I would just, uh, because nothing, I, I have uh, a couple of readings, but I, I want to make sure that the titles are right. Mm -hmm. So maybe I, I go back home, I pull mm -hmm. up my uh, laptop and then review all the uh, mm -hmm. books that... Uh, that I have there, and then maybe I'll, maybe you can attach it in the mm -hmm. description or something. Yeah, yeah, sure, we should yeah, for awesome. sure. All right, now on next chapter of the podcast, I want to do a little bit of an experiment. Not exactly an experiment. Mm -hmm. So I want you to assume that you are you want to build a you want to build a college application that will get in, get you into mm -hmm. any university in the world. Mm -hmm. So this is like a thought experiment. Mm -hmm. So how would you stack the odds in your favor? Mm. So, Wait, and, and when I want you say to, any university in the world, you mean uh, Westminster and uh, Harvard? No, and, uh, well, and I, I, meant say, I meant say Harvard, one of those top universities, one of mm. those big universities. Of top universities. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So where would you start? So you need IELTS this, you need SAT this, and mm -hmm. you need to do these extracurriculars. You have to read these books. Yeah. So, and I want you to sort of uh, create an outline of things to do so, and, and assume that you're doing it for your brother or your sister. Yeah, which right. I did. By, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't tell, right, that freshman started with my younger brother, ultimately. You did mention a relative, someone you've known since the age of th uh, 13? Uh, that's, that was no relative. Umit was our uh -huh. friend. Okay. Uh, wow, I, I, I skipped like the most important part. Freshman is the result of me preparing my younger brother. Mm -hmm. And he was in that position. Mm -hmm. He literally was in that position. At the time he had IELTS 6.5 when we started working. Mm -hmm. His SAT was also... A thousand or something. Mm -hmm. Then we had a year to prepare him for Yale US. So the first thing that you need to do is fix the academic part. So uh, yeah, how do you go about that? Uh, typically, the minimum is seven point five in most unis. Some unis require eight. So if you apply for say Princeton or Brown, you will need eight as a requirement. So that's something that you need to, to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. When you got seven point five. Typically, that getting into nine or whatever, it would take, I mean, let's, let's discuss that. To jump from five to 6.5 is so much easier than to jump from 
uh, 7.5 to 9. Would you agree with that? For sure. 100%. Like that, that jump would probably mm -hmm. take like hundreds of hours because you're mm -hmm. at the point where you're not learning at such a steep curve. Mm -hmm. There are not many wor new words that you're meeting. So like I would assume that if I were to improve my score from 8 to 9, I would need to spend a lot of time doing that. Mm -hmm. And I, like, yeah, like a lot of time doing that. So it's not really worth it to spend all of this time to up your score for 7.5 to 9, where your teachers would be like, your admissions committee would be like, oh, it's cute. Yeah, 9. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they don't really differentiate. Like, people need to understand for them, 8.5 and 9, they're equally strong. And the reason why they're equally strong is the thing called uh, the statistical uh, error. So, uh, you know, one day you wake up, whatever, you're attentive, whatever. Uh, you made you made this mistake one day you 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 did not mm -hmm. uh, you know that to a certain extent to get a nine right it's just that a lot of things need to work into place like you might be a niner but then if you go there and then something just minuscule goes wrong you make one one um, mi mistake more than than you need and then you suddenly get eight point five so ultimately for them it's a statistical error kind of situation yeah you got eight point five nine doesn't doesn't matter that much um, or even like I would say eight. Because how they use those scores is not to test whether you are prepared for college, really. Uh, they're, they're used to know if you have the bare minimum to sustain your academics, ultimately. So they use scores, and then they move on to the other sides of your application. So if you got eight, for all intents and purposes, you are set. 7.5, mostly set. There were people who got into Harvard with 7.5. Uh, but uh, then you cannot apply to some unis. So yeah, with eight, you're basically set. But then the question is, do you need to spend this time to increase from 7.5 to eight? That's a different discussion. I'm trying to be as comprehensive as possible here. Second of all, on the SAT front, um, when I took SAT, by all accounts, 1520 was enough. Now you're looking into those SAT scores and they're ridiculous. And I can attest to it that uh, the level that is needed to get 1550, you can't even compare it to what it used to be with the old SAT, where there was actual like proper exam where it would be a longer text. And now it's like what I call TikTok education. Mm -hmm. It's not really, I mean, uh, SAT and uh, SAT, they were um, kind of competing against one another. And then SAT at some point became much more difficult than ACT because ACT simplified it. So SAT also simplified it in return so that more people continue taking the SATs ultimately. But then what they did was that is that universities don't trust those scores uh, as much, I would argue. Again, nobody knows actually what's happening. So I would, I would, I would tell you that. And I personally know admissions people who worked in admissions uh, offices, and even they like, they might be confused about like, uh, and, and something that might work in a, one organization would not work in the other organization. That's also the case. So I would argue still 1520 is super solid and then you're in a green zone, but then just a bit up just to be on the safe side, maybe 1540, something along those lines so that you account for that inflation in grades that came was the simplification of the SAT, right? Um, the next, um, when it comes to extracurricular activities, there is no formula, and I can 100% like argue for that. There's no formula there. Um, there are some people who came out, again, the admissions gurus were like, oh, you need to have 10 out of 10 extracurriculars because you only can submit 10. And they're like, in their mind, they're like, yeah, like, of course we need to fill up every single one. In the case of some of the students that, that you know who got admitted to, to IVs, they submitted seven. And what it meant is that uh, whatever you submitted there was more genuine. Sometimes you just put like filler ones. Oh yeah, just like let's put like something, you know, on top of that. Um, within your extra careers, there should be some logic about how you go about things. So you can have, let's say, cycling and then um, wood carving and then something else. And then you have like a mishmash of different things. Some, but sometimes even that might work if you have a narrative that supports that. So essentially, your ECs, they can be anything. They can be all MU1s, and you have a story that actually explains and goes deeper into that, and you can be a, st a student who admi like got admitted with all MUN experiences. Like literally, all like 10 of them, they're all related to M MUN. I would not be surprised that you can actually get admitted with that. But then the narrative would, would, would be. So 
uh, when it comes to like outside of the academics, and of course, something that I forgot to mention is of course IBs, A-levels and APs and all of that. If you have access to those things, let's say in your school you have A-levels and you didn't do it, typically that's a, that's, that's a, uh, that, that worsens your chances. Because it's, it sends the signal that you're not taking the most out of the resources that are available to you. Mm -hmm. If you're in a village and there's no, like, nothing close to APs, A-levels, IBs, whatever, right? How can they expect that you would do those things if you don't have access to them? But at the same time, you'll have a little bit of har harder time explaining your academics and then showing that you're prepared for that academic level. So, and I worked with public school students. I know it's hard, but it's doable, and you can do that with SAT and IELTS alone. It's a different question when many people get APs, IBs, whatever, and you're competing with them. Um, would your academic record be as strong as for you to pass to the next stage of the admissions review? That's a little bit of a tricky situation, but it's not like the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. Last year, people without SATs got admitted from backgrounds where they could not do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So like whoever is saying that, yeah, just by doing academics, that will increase your, the number of uh, SAT 1550 pluses that got rejected from every school they applied for is massive. The vast majority of them get, get rejected. You think so, it has anything to do with the fact that SATs got easier and there's no, such thing no, as score no, inflation? No, I think it has to do with the fact that a lot of those people, they over-focused on exams and, and mm -hmm. didn't understand that, look, uh, everything else is infinitely more important because uh, you never get admitted because of uh, an exam score. Mm -hmm. Did you hear uh, any, anything along those lines before? Yeah, that I did. I there did. is it's no just... university that will be like, like it's a Yale room or mm -hmm. Harvard room and they're like, oh, he, he scored you know, nine on IELTS, admit him. Uh -huh. Never oh, Or SAT 1600. Yeah, yeah. or SAT uh, 1600. It's no. never like, oh, yeah, he's a genius, let's mm -hmm. admit him or let's admit her. Never the case. Mm -hmm. So how it hap like how it works is that oh he has a uh, very interestingly high exam scores, which is like I mean by several standard deviations higher than most people in his country. Let's look more into his, uh, his or her case. And what often happens is that these guys spend so many hours on getting from like seven point five to nine mm -hmm. that they don't have the time to do everything else, which is the reason why you'll get admitted. They don't have extracurricular exposure. They don't have professional experience. They don't have research experience because they spend most of this time on preparing on the exams. And that's my ultimate argument when I say move on because mm -hmm. there are a lot more important things than that. Um, so uh, that's something I actually realized after I talked to Mr. Rustam, I talked to Parviz and all the other guys, part of the freshman academy, and I've become convinced that so the IELTS and SAT make up only 20, 30% of their college application. So the other day, I got, I got a visit by a student who's, who wants to get into some UK, US university and she, was, mm -hmm. she basically wanted me to help her get, go from seven to eight within a month, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I was talking to her and I could tell her English was amazing and she could just self-study and do it in two weeks. So wow. I was telling her that there's no point taking our program here. Oh, that's, which that's is, awesome that you do that. By yeah, the way. because... Uh, because when we're making these decisions, we need to we gotta we gotta do it with the kids' interest in mind, Absolutely. not our interest in mind. Like it's something so rare these days, and and I don't think I would have done that if I didn't have those podcasts, mm. right? You see, so I'm now becoming more convinced that things like extracurriculars uh, weigh so much more than your IELTS and your SATs. Yes. So because I've heard kids getting get into one of those schools, top schools, Harvard, Ivy League schools, without even IELTS, without even SAT, but even though it's so Sometimes they compensated days. it with A-levels, by yeah. the way. So a lot of those stories, I would look into them, mm -hmm. but there were cases where people just could not take exams and they mm -hmm. did not take exams. And then the school was like, mm -hmm. you know what? Um, we're confident in other parts of your application mm -hmm. that you can sustain it and you're coming from background where you could not do it. Mm -hmm. So it's fine. Yeah. Universities are a very... And again, when I say that, of course, those are rare cases. Of course, it's one out of a thousand. But to get admitted is one of a, out of a thousand to start with. So you mm -hmm. can put your, all, all your bets on that. Four students from Uzbekistan got admitted to IVs, public school students, uh, uh, Uzbek citizens last year. 
just four. You need to put that into perspective. Like how hard is it like on a scale from zero to 10? Because when you say that, most people don't get how hard it is. Yeah. So on a scale zero to 10, how hard would you say for oh, man, public school students? I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's next level. It's, yeah. it's, it's nothing that you probably mm-hmm. experienced in your life as a mm-hmm. high schooler. But then again, of course, admissions is much easier than education itself. Mm-hmm. Everything that I shared with you right now, it's through, you know, blood, sweat and t- tears. It mm-hmm. was not like, oh yeah, I just sat there and I opened the book. Like I literally wanted to drop out, out of uni first semester because it was so hard. Um, admissions is really hard. And then studying is even harder than that. Uh, I can give you one example to just to give you a perspective. Um, we had, mm, we helped last year and this year was or- organization of a, a thing called Ibrat Camp. Mm-hmm. So we set up selection process based on how universities make selection process. It was actually very rigorous. We invited mentors who did the selection process. We built the curriculum for the students, right? And then last year there were 16,000 applications and not all of them for, were for, for bachelors, I would estimate. And every time I say a different number, sometimes I say 14,000, sometimes I say, you know, last year it was 14,000, somewhere around that. Like, again, don't take my word for it. I don't know the exact number, but somewhere around 13, 14,000 kids applied. Out of them, about 70% were bachelors. So it's what, 7K, 7,000 mm-hmm. students. And the camp is about admissions. It's a free camp organized by the youth agency, all about admissions, top university admissions. So there were 7,000 students interested in the three cohorts of that, who applied for three cohorts of that camp last year. We selected 600 out of them, right? Imagine how many people apply from Uzbekistan to those schools if you look at just those numbers, at just that, this camp. It's hundreds of people, if not thousands of people. Just take every presidential school, they are all applying somewhere. Just every presidential school. And there's TIS. In Tashkent, there are like a dozen of really solid uh, schools, right? And out of all of them, four students. Can you imagine that? It's just, it's but now, one... but now, look, now look at freshman stats in perspective. There were probably 14 students from Uzbekistan in the past four years from the way we started it. Before, they were like, I mean, not even two students per year. We had cases, like we had years where no one from Uzbekistan applied uh, and got admitted to bachelors. That was pre-freshman started ultimately. And then people who got admitted, it was either TIS or it was like a very, very, very few schools that actually had the capacity and logistics to do that. So since then, there were maybe 14 to 15 students, maybe I'm actually, maybe 12 or something, but around that number, Again, we, I can't tell you exactly, but around that number of Uzbek public school students who got admitted to IVs, maybe less. I, am, I think I am uh, probably giving too much of maybe 13, 14, or something along those lines. But nonetheless, um, seven or eight of them were freshman students, right? And we're talking about Uzbekistan, like like every every single resource on I, like IV admission, it's everywhere, podcasts. Okay, we don't have podcasts, I guess, except for what you're doing, but now we do. Uh, mm-hmm. Hundreds of people, camps, uh, lots of support. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly challenging uh, environment, incredibly challenging space. And then when people like share this simplistic argument, so like, yeah, yeah, just like, take exams, do this, do that, have a passion project, have this and that. I personally become offended because I'm in that space for, what, eight years now, personally, six years, uh, five years with freshman, six years uh, with my younger brother uh, before freshman even started to exist. Uh, and because we spend so much effort into this, and then when I, when I hear misinformation like that, like to, to me, I take it personally almost. Uh, mm-hmm. Because I know just how how devastating, really bad advice can be in admissions. And by the way, I'm pretty sure some of our advice that we gave and we give is also one that's not optimal. It, it's like it's a situation where nobody knows really how things work because they're changing policies. Universities have different policies between themselves, and um, you know things do change. And now we have ChatGPT that that we can have like a whole thing there. Um, nobody really knows the full picture, but there are some, some people who worked with enough cases, who have enough of experience of working with public school students from our region, who know that 
you knew the nuances and who know the principles and yeah. I, I don't know if people tried, people with lots of resources tried to replicate what we're doing and almost, it, it always failed because not only you need people from there, you need people who are passionate about this field, who had experiences, who they built with. Freshman started was just working for free. Mm -hmm. Whenever we'll take a dollar for admissions help for two years. And I was already at Yale and US. I could have made a lot of bank, like much money just selling course or whatever. For me, my job was, okay, can we understand actually what's going on? Because yes, I helped myself. Yes, at that time I helped my brother. But I still, like, it's, it's a whole ocean. And now six years into it, and I'm still... And I literally interviewed Dean of Yale College. I speak with some of the best profs. I talk with admissions uh, committee people. And still, I feel like I know maybe 30, 40% of everything that's happening there. Yeah. So it, I, I don't think we got, we, we got to the bottom of this yet. Mm -hmm. But my, my vision is that if we have Singapore office with that, those kinds of professionals there, I think we can create one of the most rigorous IV prep companies, boutique ones, right? Small ones, not some big crimson level ones in, in the world. And that's, that's, that, that's my vision. But it's not something that's happening in a year. It's not something that's happening in two years. To build something like that, something ambitious like that, it, it's, freshman when we started, we knew it's at least 10, 15 years. Yeah. So it's a very, very long-term work. And everyone in the space, we have students who got admitted into IVs from freshmen. And uh, they, now in the contracts, we say that you cannot work in the admissions industry. You cannot teach people admissions after graduating from freshman courses. And, and wh it's why in the not? contract. Huh? Why not? Why? Because you're just not ready. You uh -huh. think that you're, you know, you just got admitted and mm -hmm. then, the, you know, you got admitted and then you got lucky ultimately too because mm -hmm. it's a gamble in many ways. Many things worked out for you. Mm -hmm. You're in no position to educate anyone uh, at that point. Just like I was not in no position, even if I got all mm -hmm. these amazing exams and then I was more knowledgeable than mm -hmm. potentially at that point than m most experts, just by definition, because there were so many, uh, so few people, I was maybe in the top three of people in Uzbekistan who understood how it works. But then still for me, it was important to just recognize the weight of the, dis like it's a huge burden. You're deciding the life of a person for the next four, five, six years of their lives. And then how you as a, j just the one, just the person who just got admitted, you never spent a day on campus. You, yeah, like to me, to me, that's, that's a bit tricky. But can they at least help someone out two, three years into their own university studies after they get some experience? No, they need, they need to spend some time just learning the ropes mm. and then, you know, just doing it maybe for free or mm. for, uh, uh, and then people get admitted and then they create mm -hmm. like whole course inf info business, whatever mm -hmm. thing where the whole purpose is to make money. The, the mm -hmm. purpose is not to like educate people really. Oftentimes it's, it's, it's that mm -hmm. kind of purpose. And to me, it's really betraying the logic of that movement and the philosophy of that movement that started this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Right. If not like, and I will, I will speak, I understand that it might sound as bragging, but it's, it's in reality, those who are in the field for long enough, that big movement that is built now with all the influencers and everything, it's built on the idea that you can get admitted into those universities. And if you look into who were the people who got admitted, right? Those were Umid, who was the first one, uh, Rustam, who was the second one at Yale, for example, then Murad, who got admitted to Yale, then a bunch of other guys who did it independently. And I mean, that's that's also a whole other thing when people say they did it independently they oftentimes had some help from either elder sisters elder brothers professors uh from unis or people who studied who were american citizens uh being in the us and who graduated from those unis and, and advised them very rarely you would find someone who just got admitted without any sort of assistance right but then uh, what i'm trying to say is that um we have a responsibility to ensure that the admissions field doesn't go nuts. Mm -hmm. And I feel like more and more it goes nuts with people arguing that, oh yeah, IVs, IVs, IVs. Which IVs? Four, four students out of uh, thousands. Mm -hmm. And it's not getting higher. Look at Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan has like, yeah, sure, they have twice as many. Okay, they have eight, let's say. There are some years where Kazakhstan doesn't have anyone in some, like at Yale, for example. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, even with all of their resources and support and everything that they get. What I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of hype. Uh, there's a lot of excitement. 
I think that it's a pendulum. I think it will all go down at the moment people realize that we're talking about very, very low numbers. But knowing how, uh, uh, how uh, just um, hardworking people in Uzbekistan are, I think maybe it will, this craziness will all, only increase. I will not be surprised by that too. Mm -hmm. But I will not be surprised if in, in a year or two I, I, we have this meeting and then you'll have much fewer people tuning into this discussion mm -hmm. because they'll be like disenchanted full on with all of these gurus and, uh, and experts and advisors and whatever who um, uh, portray this image that it's possible. Our, our, uh, my my master is that, guys, it's, it, it's not possible. It's not possible uh, for the vast majority of you. It would be possible for 20 of you, and then it's a gamble between 20 to 30 students in Uzbekistan, who gets into Harvard or Yale, but basically. Would you not say it's still worth the pursuit? Like, because uh, even if they are not getting into university, they're yeah. building some experience. That's an argument, but right? look, people lose their minds on this. Mm -hmm. And just like, you may not see it, but then I see people applying every single year. Guys, you could have graduated from Westminster, did must, like you could have done masters by this point. There are some people my, who I applied with who, you know, uh, to this day, they're like, oh, yeah, maybe I should reapply again and again and mm -hmm. again and again. Like, and, and Harvard even set the limit on the number of times you can apply. Yeah, really. You can only apply three times. And why do they have that? Because people go crazy because they're mm -hmm. like, okay, maybe a bit more, maybe my SAT, maybe mm -hmm. my this. You can lose your life in this. Yeah. But again, Harvard and Yale are tools. Use them mm -hmm. uh, and see them as tools. They're not end goals. Right. And yeah. even before you start worrying about getting into university, do you actually need university? There's this yeah. new, new movement yeah. actually called uh, university is a scam. Like, do you think it's just a, a talking point by self-help like influencers. Yeah, influencers on social media or there is some truth to it? They're right about professional schools oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Let's say teaching marketing for four years in college. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, you can become a phenomenal marketer just by working in marketing oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And from that point of view, maybe they're right. But then the kind of education that Yale, Harvard, uh, and whatever, like, whatever those schools provide, it's so timeless and it's so unique. Mm -hmm. I assume, like now I'm, I'm, I'm telling you all that, you're a person who worked in the educational sphere for God knows how, mm -hmm. how many years. Did you hear any of that before from any institution? Outside? Like probably not. And uh, that's the value of liberal arts education ultimately that I'm so adamantly promoting mm -hmm. among Central Asian students, I think it's just timeless. Mm -hmm. A lot of, it's not, it's not about technical knowledge. A lot of people are like, oh, my economics prof is making less money than my father who works in business. What can he teach me? Your economics prof is not about like making money. Like oftentimes they go into economics precisely because they want to understand how the system work works and then how you know, the correlate, they want to go deeper into society. And that means that they will not be making a lot of money, but they will be far most experts in whatever they study. So learn from them. It's much deeper than just how to make money. Mm -hmm. It's much deeper than, you know, all the practical pursuits or um, becoming a millionaire and whatever. That's the kind of, um, uh, like matrix that I fight against the idea that, oh, if you don't have money, then you're good for nothing. It's a very new capitalist idea. Uh, society never worked like that. There were people who, let's say in the past, in some parts of the world, it was counter, like if you had money, then you were a more, you were like people saw you as immoral. Having money equaled, it was something negative. Because if you made money, then you probably, you know, scammed someone, you lied to people, you had all these dealings and traded, all of that involves some sort of a, you know, deeply problematic, uh, behavior of competition of you know uh, outplaying and outcompeting other people. There were parts of history where people saw those people on the top, as we see them now, as profoundly uh, sinful, as profoundly corrupt. Right. So um, it's that's, that's what I'm trying to say. It's like it's not that black and white as people in, as teenagers see see it right now. Um, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, these are some perspectives that would never cross my mind, honestly. It's just mind blown thinking about hearing about that from you and thinking about that. Right. And how do you feel about university education being online? Because there are now a lot of actually YouTube influencers 
mm-hmm. with their own online universities. Yeah. I, I don't mean Entertage University. Yeah. I mean, recently Jordan Peterson announced that he'd be teaching online. He's, yeah. He founded his own no, the guys university. Are, no, at least what I like about uh, Jordan Peterson approach is that uh, he's an intellectual. Mm-hmm. And again, I think he he is very similar to Alexander Dugan, brought his personal uh, experiences. Because what I don't know if you know all of his history, but then uh, he became popular by being contrarian on campuses, by refusing to call someone by their pronouns. And mm-hmm. then he got kicked out by academia. And that, that created a lot of resentment in him against academia, which I think he became a lot more radical, I would argue, in the past years as compared to the pre- like before. Mm-hmm. Uh, because before it was like all about like lectures and, uh, it, and, and now he's seeing things that I don't think are like exist. He has like borderline conspiracies. There's some sort of a movement that is going to get you killed. Like, I just, I don't believe in all of the, all of that. And I respect him, of course, and he's much more knowledgeable than me, but it doesn't mean, and he understands academia much better than me, but nobody is a proof against your own biases, your own experiences and views and your political beliefs going into your science, which I think would happen in, in his case. I think those two merged. And that's where the danger often, uh, where the danger lies in. Um, but uh, Andrew Tate, I think, is a, is a brilliant, brilliant guy. Absolutely brilliant guy. He sensed that there was a gap in content. He, he sensed that there was a group of people who were under facilitated with the uh, sort of information. Uh, and then there was no one courageous enough to speak things out that a big part of the world finds natural, but then in the media, there's no representation of that. And why? Because media is controlled by ultimately people who study in top schools and who are, you know, highly educated. Um, Andrew Tate took uh, points that, let's say, my uncle would say, (laughs) you know, uh, and then, like, I don't think he said anything particularly ingenious, but then the fact that he said it on such a big platform deeply resonated with people because, like, oh, wow, like, I feel that I'm represented there. Mm. But another genius thing that he did, he realized that he could say whatever, but then he can sell something completely different. Let's say if you look at his, you know, oh, let's, uh, you know, remove the matrix and uh, let's let's tackle that and challenge that, which is, you know, its own realm. And then he's selling courses on how to like do uh, what drop shipping or whatever, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Which is, has nothing to do with that sort of political activism that he's promoting. Mm-hmm. So he realized that he can actually be an incredible, incredibly successful commercial uh, offer, commercial product, with his views being totally different from what he's selling. Ultimately, I think that was the biggest insight. That yeah. and just being associated with with state, right? Paying to learn whatever I don't know how to trade on um, Amazon uh, some products uh, that already felt like association with him and his like bigger mission that he promoted. So I think in many ways, I mean. Absolutely unprecedented, unprecedented uh, figure and a person who I studied and I still study as a phenomena. So uh, I think it's, it's just, yeah. And it was the same technique as Trump did it. Mm-hmm. A lot of underrepresented voices in, on big stage. Let's just have courage to say what they think. Do I agree with uh, a lot of points that he's saying? Actually, most points I disagree. Again, as a social scientist, uh, I understand why they appeal to people, but part like that's precisely why I disagree with them because oftentimes what appeals to people is not really accurate. And you can, a lot of his statements, you can unpack and then with clear cut logic, explain how, where he's wrong and, and evidence, but that's not what he is promoting here. He's promoting a feeling. It's not, it's not even logic or you might feel like you're connecting with it, but um, it's not on the basis of logic what I'm trying to say. It's the, on the basis of underrepresentation of certain ideas in the main media. But don't you think the world, the world was much better place under his presidency? Like there was under, under whose presidency? Donald Trump. I mean, but see, again, correlation versus causation. Is mm-hmm. it because of him? Or is, it be, or is it because some of the processes that were launched pre-him? It's, it might seem like it's an easy... Mm-hmm again, like question, but there are like researchers who spent lifetime studying this and still like they would not be able to. I mean, just a simple example, yeah. like it was because of him that the Middle East, the Palestine, they signed the Abraham Accords, which brought, which brought peace Yeah, but, but at the, the same region. time, he was the person who moved the capital to Jerusalem mm-hmm. that uh, ultimately sparked the, what we're having right now mm-hmm. uh, and the horrible atrocities that are happening. Um, Partly the move of the capital to Jerusalem was the one that sparked that. 
because it was status quo that Tel Aviv was official capital. And then he just came out there and he said, hey, look, now Jerusalem is. And then, yes, it was under Biden that everything is happening right now. But then mm -hmm. what was that move? What kind of effect it had on mm -hmm. what we're having here? Again, what I'm trying to say, I'm, I'm not trying to criticize Donald Trump. And I, I understand that a lot of things that I said today, they were, um, I mean, analytical of certain figures and everything. My job here is not to say they're bad. My job here is to say that they are phenomena that you need to study, mm -hmm. not people who you need to necessarily follow. Um, uh, you need to follow professors. You need to follow like people in academia if you want to understand how the world actually works, because that's what they're doing with the big, best tools that are available. But um, those individuals, they're extremely popular. They're phenomena. Uh, you, uh, yeah, there's so much that you can learn just by observing them. And that's mm -hmm. what I would... Uh, inspire your students, your your followers to do. Mm -hmm. uh, don't pass judgment. Just again, have that third person perspective. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. People are interesting, right? People are interesting. Yeah, they're a lot more fascinating than we think. A lot more so. complex too. <clears throat> what are some red flags you can think of on a college application, some red flags students should avoid. Yeah. Um, so you would say like, don't never do this. Again, again I, will, I will say it, I will say it as mm -hmm. um, someone who is objective here. If you write that you're an Andrew Tate fan, <laughs> you'll have a much lower chance of getting admitted. Because he's such a controversial figure? Uh, because a lot of his views are very incompatible with the kind of views that Harvard or Yale promote. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but again, guys, again, but, I would want to stress something uh -huh. here. It's not, I don't want to criticize, mm -hmm. you might be a fan of Andrew Tate and find solace in what he's saying. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying from my perspective of applying to universities, right? Mm -hmm. Any sort of cultural manifestation, reflection of you saying, oh, um, certain groups of people need to be limited, um, certain groups of people passing judgment stereotypes and all of that. It's just impossible mm -hmm. in the college uh, setting. Uh, a lot of this vocalism, I, I studied I studied it, I experienced it myself. Where is it coming from? I can give you a specific example. Uh, you know, sometimes we just joke around each other about some uh, parts of the world, about some countries, passing stereotypes and everything. And then you just like say that joke and it's fine. You're all from Uzbekistan, you're all from Bukhara, from Samarkand, from, yeah. The problem is that in any space in those universities that you pass those stereotypical jokes, you will have people in the room who will be representatives of those cultures oftentimes. So if here you can joke about some country and like them being this and that, when you go there, you will have all sorts of countries, all sorts of viewpoints. <clears throat> so whatever you say, your chance of offending someone mm -hmm. <clears throat> is massive. But then our judgment is that, oh, but it's so bad, it's limiting speech and, and all of that. But let's take our case. When we go to some of the neighboring countries and people pass judgments on what it means to be Uzbek, of what Uzbekistan represents, some of the judgment, and I experienced, uh, I mean, to a, to a lesser extent, but I did experience that even, let's say Kazakhs, right? Uh, when they, uh, when people mention Borat and they, they some Americans genuinely think that this is what Kazakhstan looks like, which uh -huh. is which is crazy, right? Uh, this is the kind of stereotypes that um, we don't want against ourselves, too. So as it's protecting other groups, it's protecting us too. So that's where vocalism is, com is coming from. Mm -hmm. But it's not just ethnic dimension; it's the gender dimension too. Let's say, imagine you are a girl from Uzbekistan who worked really hard to convince your parents to go to Yale or Harvard. You were in a system where, that told you that your worth is you know, certain gender roles that you'll need to follow. And you persevered, persevered against that. And then you were told that, oh, why do you need education? You will end up just being in a marriage and that's fine. Imagine you're someone like that and you persevered, you got into Harvard. And then you have some guy from a different country who's a fan of, uh, let's say, some of those figures that I mentioned. And then he's telling you like, oh, listen, uh, your place is there and here you need to do this and that. You know what I mean? Like it's, mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it's that, yeah, I get it. it's different social groups that you put together and that like 
that Vogue culture mm-hmm. arises from diversity that exists. Mm-hmm. Diversity that protects you and me, diversity that protects everyone in many ways. But of course, it limits the kinds of discussions that you might have. Yeah. So, so that's my take on it. But again, what I'm, what I'm mentioning right now, I have been thinking about this for years mm-hmm. and I mean it because things didn't make sense to me. And I was not just happy with those like, oh, it works simple, you know, that Vogue culture mm-hmm. arises from diversity that exists. Mm-hmm. Diversity that protects you and me, diversity that protects everyone in many ways. But of course, it limits the kinds of discussions that you might have. Yeah. So, so that's my take on it. But again, what I'm, what I'm mentioning right now, I have been thinking about this for years mm-hmm. and I mean it because things didn't make sense to me. And I was not just happy with those like, oh, it works simple. You know, uh, it's this and that they believe in this. You are in this group. You're a conservative. You're this, you're that. I just, I just thought, uh, to be honest, a lot of those points were just too simple mm-hmm. and not true. Um, so that's where those, yeah. And I addressed some of the questions that I'm, uh, that we're discussing, I talked about it with Dean Pericles of Yale College. And then he sometimes shared the sentiment, sometimes pushed against my points, and I refined them further. But yeah. Right. Yeah. What an inter- interesting world. It's fascinating. <laughs> I yeah, mean, just, I mean, look, you don't, yeah, you don't need to create all sorts of narratives or uh, like if you don't know something, it's fine to say, I don't know, mm-hmm. I, I don't know, you know. Uh, and uh, sometimes we don't know and then we build a certain narrative to connect the dots. Mm-hmm. But then I think it's ultimate moral courage to say, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And then maybe no one knows some of the answers. And to live with that uncertainty is something that people could not achieve for years. So that's why we needed general public would need some sort of a system of beliefs that holds everything together. And that system of beliefs, again, I would argue by definition is mythological by definition. There's even this uh, concept in social sciences, national myth making. It's creating myths around certain national identities, certain like patriotism that we have. They might not be true, but by believing they're true, we effectively make them oftentimes true of what, how we see ourselves, how we shape our, of, uh, like our self image of what it means to be Uzbek, what it means to be from Central Asia and so on. Those are again, very, very complex topics that we're like unpacking here today. And I hope that in our discussion, people, like my job was to just introduce you guys to other points of view. It's not that I, I share too much of my judgment here. Uh, yeah, uh, it's just like I kind of pr- present like if you are, that's what I do oftentimes and I told you about it. When I'm in those liberal institutions, oftentimes I need to defend Uzbekistan's points of view mm-hmm. because I feel that's what they're missing out on. I feel like they just don't understand some culture history behind it. When I'm here, oftentimes I need to do the opposite. And my goal is not to really convince people that the other side is right. My goal is to just show that the other side is not idiots and they're not just enemies that we need to like, you know, take out, like they don't belong on this earth. And then if they stopped existing, everything everything would be uh, fine and everything. I guarantee you, if you are anti-liberal, say, and you want to take all those, what like people who scare you, groups of people who scare you, you take them out, Trust me, you will find some other group to to hate, and mm-hmm. you will find some other, and you will create like some other identity too, because uh, because that's how it works ultimately. It has always worked like that. So so yeah, I can totally see what you're doing here right now. You are trying to give as nuanced argument as possible. Mm-hmm. You're making arguments for and against at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which I really appreciate, right? And that takes a lot of intelligence. Just I'm 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 in awe right now. It's a level of sophistication and richness you have in your argumentation and the ability to present that in a, such a way that's uh, that's just a whole different level of intelligence. Again, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's it's anyone could do that yeah. if they got exposed to the kind of education that I mm-hmm. was exposed to with an open mind. Mm-hmm. We had cases uh, of people from Central Asia who came in and who were like, oh, let me teach everyone how Uzbekistan has the best social system in the world. Mm-hmm. I'm like, look, if you came to uni and then you're the same person in four years compared to what you used to be, mm-hmm. you probably didn't learn much. Mm-hmm. And then the answer is not like, okay, let's adopt every Western value because that would be ridiculous. Uzbekistan has so much to offer to the world. Mm-hmm. But the problem is that we lack vocabulary. We lack, again, uh, 
communication, understanding of the other point of view to situate Uzbekistan and our culture in the broader trends that are happening. Mm -hmm. So that's why we find ourselves on the sidelines, you know, we find ourselves sort of one of those countries that, or one of those cultures that, but more and more that's changing with the recent developments. But partly because we can't communicate to these people who we are because we don't know how they truly think and it's, we can't adapt basically Uzbekistan's culture our, to how they think, to the kind of language that they use, to the kind of concepts that they use. So it's the process of translation. It's a process of translating not words but concepts basically and mapping like they have their own map of meanings, right? And we're trying and we have our own and sort of like trying to connect the dots there and be like, okay, guys, that's what you think in, in your place. But that's how even say feminism, uh, right? Feminism uh, is so different. When you say you, I, I heard a lot of people in Uzbekistan saying that they are skeptical of borderline. Like I even heard the word hate feminism. Mm which is, again, it's a position that you hold. I, I don't judge you for that, uh, even though, yeah, I mean, it's a position that I deeply disagree with. Uh, when you say feminism, do you mean initial feminism that only white, it was a movement of white women in America to elevate not all women in the world, but specifically one group of women. So initial feminism was not about uh, African-American women. Mm -hmm. It was just about one subgroup of, of people. And then the next wave and the next wave and the next wave. And we're in a position where, um, let's say, um, something like a, a hijab by Western fa uh, you know, feminists, it's considered to be you know, oppressive, whatever. But then if you look into Iran and Iranian revolution, hijab was the symbol of liberation, of female liberation. So it's a completely different system of coordinates. A system of interpretations, uh, you know, and then you took this two, you take these two worlds, they don't just understand each other. Even you can speak English with them, and then you'll be speaking one thing, they will not, you will not understand each other. Like that's the bottom line. And uh, to me, it takes someone who understands both that part and this part, language concepts, system of meaning, to be able to connect the world that is so torn apart, that is so fundamentally, uh, seems like it's broken. Um, yeah. That's yeah. a big mission. That's a really big mission to take on. Right. The, judging by the conversation we're having right now, I, I'm starting just to realize that we are just identities. We're, we're entities trying to just figure out yeah, how things work, how things work really. Yeah. And no one really knows the answer. I mean, no. it's not like no one, I think it's not that the truth doesn't exist too, mm -hmm. right? Because that's some, that's the lesson that some people take. Like, oh, truth doesn't exist. It's all moral relativism and everything. Truth simply is, is in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. I don't simply, I don't agree with that. Because there are certain tools, analytical tools with which you can approach truth. Mm -hmm. So yeah, sure, you might not know whether your hand is real, mm -hmm. but it's sort of utilitarian, like from the utilitarian standpoint, I better believe it so that I can exist and reason with you and everything. Mm -hmm. Some truth we just need to take as assumptions. Yeah, sure, we might be in a simulation, but I better, you know, uh, as, a, as an entity with my limited view, I better treat it as a real thing uh, so that I can productively operate in that. Some truths are utilitarian, uh, like are justified by their utilitarian value. Some truths are just, you know, arguments are better than others objectively you look at the evidence and then like like the world is not flat right even though it's just not flat mm -hmm. and uh some people use the same argument by the way as i told you about the hand to justify that the world is flat so they would say something along the lines of look how do you know that the world is flat somebody told you mm -hmm. then there's like nasa there's all these organizations this uh like uh professors uh phd people all cosmonauts who all they all are lying to you in saying that the world is spherical but the thing is there's this uh there's this uh tool called occam's razor in argumentation so what Or occam's razor is saying is that uh the simplest points are typically the right ones. Okay, let me just just give you an example of what I mean by that. What's more realistic, that you are lied to by millions of people or that the Earth is actually spherical and then that's supported by all sorts of, you know, physical things that you can prove even yourself? 
Like what's more realistic? One small thing that explains a thousand things or uh, like one argument that you need a thousand arguments to support. So in the case of flat earth, you really need to make like 10,000 arguments to make it work. Whereas the earth is spherical, it explains suddenly. So if you like do it like a chart, you can take like the earth is spherical and from it, like go a thousand different explanations and the things that make sense. Oh, time works this way because of that. Oh, we can send, oh, like, uh, you know, the band and curvature, whatever, right? Um, you can explain so many things based on that. Whereas um, from the, if you were to justify that the word is flat, you will need to do the other way around. You'll need to show that, oh, they're lying, this lying, like physical concepts don't work. Oh, you, you need to look at it from that way, which in theory you could have like done, but then ultimately what's more, what's a better argument, right? So it's not like truth doesn't exist. There are no better arguments or worse arguments, but um, that uh, it, it, it is just that um, a lot of our, especially when it comes to social sciences, it's, yeah, there's personal interest, there are personal biases, family mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, so it's not science, of course. So that's, that's what makes it tricky. Right. Yeah. Like I'd like to believe that there is really truth. There might be truth, but there isn't really any universal truth. And the fact that there isn't one maybe is a good thing so that we have, we're on this planet trying to explore, try to, trying to find it, yeah. right? If we had a clear cut answer to that question, then we'd have no purpose, Yeah. right? We'd have no reason to exist. Then we'd all just uh, in, try to ser ser serve that purpose and be no different than robots. And this is something I don't, I didn't exactly develop myself as a concept rather borrowed from Naval Rabikant. I'm not sure if you know the guy, Naval Rabikant. No way. You, you don't know Naval Rabikant. He's one of the, he? he's an angel investor. He's the, he's a philosopher. He is, he, he was, he was famous for his podcast with Joe Rogan and you have to check it out. Oh, yeah, absolutely. To, I will. Yeah, Naval Rabikant. No, I yeah. And the, he's the author of the book, The Almanac. Mm. I'm not sure if, if you've ever I, heard I about it. Most really heard about yeah. it, never, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, that's what he basically said about you know the meaning of life. There is, yeah, the the question is more interesting than the answer. Yeah, yeah. I agree. The I question agree. is more interesting than the yeah. answer. No, to, to me, the, even yeah. a big, bigger question is not what's the meaning of life, uh, but how meanings are created. Uh -huh. How we create meanings. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, I do have an answer to that question, though. Mm. I think meaning is the product of your labor. Product of your labor. Yeah, this is, which is uh, uh, that's what I'm always telling my staff. Just not just to motivate, push them to work hard. They're just to say to them, you know, if you want to have a meaningful, good life, mm. you making enough money won't do it. Won't, won't cut it. You have to have to. You have to put in the hours, mm. so you feel fulfilled with the things. It's a very done. capitalistic yeah. uh, explanation <laughs> of meaning, by the way. <laughs> it's a product or, yeah. of labor. Yeah, in, in certain way, yeah, it's it's what you put your time into, right? Um, but yeah, then, can example, you think of meaning mm -hmm. outside of labor? Mm -hmm. Outside labor, not really. Honestly, no. Because at I mean, this point, I've I don't know. I think I'm just brainwashed to think that for me to have a meaningful life mm -hmm. one day, I have to break some sweat. Mm -hmm. Like this podcast wouldn't be as meaningful mm -hmm. if you didn't spend all these years studying, doing your research, you know, so that you could come on this show and share with you, share with us, with our audience, all this, all these insights, knowledge, information you gained over the years. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. Interesting. Or you just take things for granted, right? If you were just given those things, you didn't have to earn them or, or work for hard for them. It might sound, uh, I don't know, simplistic way of looking at things, but mm -hmm. yeah, that kind of helps me, you know, navigate my way in this world. Like if, if I want to have meaning, then I'm, I'm just going to have to show up to work every day, help mm -hmm. people contribute and yeah, because I honestly don't know what the alternative is. Maybe I never pushed myself hard enough to consider the alternative. Yeah. yeah but after this podcast, for sure, I'm, I'm. If anything, after this podcast, I'm going to be leaving more skeptical of things, like be more exploratory, explanatory, exploration. Like take on the mindset of exploration and just learning about the world and being 
more open-minded than I already am. I'd like to think I'm an open-minded guy, but after listening to you, I don't think I'm <laughs> nowhere Look, again, near, nowhere, nowhere again, close. Given but, that but you, you are see, based in Bukhara, yeah. most of the people that you spend with are people yeah. in your circle. That's uh-huh. phenomenal, like, mm. I, and I mean it. You know What you built here mm-hmm. um, in Bukhara, mm-hmm. uh, it's absolutely phenomenal. And the, the, what you're providing uh, the guys with is mm-hmm. experience of, Ultimately, the outside world in a very local context is mm-hmm. something that I can. Uh, and again, you need to teach me uh, how to do that because I, I think, yeah, it, it's 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 a lot of work. I can tell. Yeah, and, and I'd really you know love it one day if you had your own branch or you know so your campus in Samarkand. So you would maybe one day. You, you, you totally should. You totally should because you see. Uh, here at this school, we can prepare students up to a certain level, mm-hmm. and then from there, we need the you know the the, the bigger dogs. The or I don't know. If no, I definitely right. don't think myself yeah. as that. I, I, like, so as we that. need the bigger guys. Yeah, I think it's just that we're doing different things. Yeah, uh, I, I would put it that way. Uh, I don't think I would be mm-hmm. able like if I were to take IELTS right now. Mm-hmm. No, I, 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 I don't. Not, I did not mean IELTS. What I meant was like because I there's more to life than IELTS. It's, I, I mean like education. Yeah, and, but, and but you're doing you're so doing the yeah you're doing your treatment mm-hmm. based operation. Mm-hmm. You're not necessarily selecting the best kid. Mm-hmm. Like what we do. No, we is, are. We are. Oh, you're selecting, are. right? Oh, yes, oh sir, yeah, we yeah. Are. I take it by the <laughs> We do. <laughs> take it we by. do. We do. We do. So yeah. we literally have admissions where we our passing score is seven. And then after that, they have to sit in an interview with me personally. And then we talk so about your want, future, oh, why you want to go from 7 to 8 or possibly 8.5. And I, do, do it means people be below 7? Like, do you have those kinds of courses or no? No, we do. We, we do yeah. teach. No, but see, st- still, still. still. But even it, those yeah. students actually have to come and sit an admission test and get as, uh, FAQs we have, like mm-hmm. a list of FAQs. Yeah. And make sure they're fit for the program. Yeah. So we do have this filtration yeah. system. Yeah. Yeah. No, where but, we are sort of getting the cream of the crop i guess that's what they say yeah. yeah and sometimes we get back backlash for that because we're putting out all these great results and people say well it's natural that you guys have all you these results very ones, right? yeah just like harvard but uh, but there is still a lot of work that needs to be done like building that environment yeah. and the logistics of it and a lot yeah. there is a lot that goes into it but at the same time i understand the limitations of our program and that's one of the reasons why i started this podcast so i could get in touch with more people like you you know pick your brain and learn about the outside world and i don't simply have the privilege of doing this right doing this right doing that thing right now mm-hmm. i can't just drop this and go mm-hmm. and do my masters or my undergrad graduate studies all over again on social st- sciences or studies, mm-hmm. right? And I feel like the best thing I can do right now is have a platform where we can discuss these topics where, where they can, I can just sit and be educated on these mm-hmm. different topics, broaden my mind and bring some of that into the classroom and share with my students. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's, that's, that's my thinking here. I very much share yeah. that, but uh, just building upon that, uh-huh. uh, Parviz, one of your students, mm-hmm. when he joined freshman, he was already on such a high level, mm-hmm. and then we took mm-hmm. what was there, right? And I mm-hmm. mean, I, I don't want to claim that. Uh, and that, that's what I had in mind, the sort of collaboration. Yeah, right. so, so what, I'm, what I'm saying is that every single teacher who helps our students to get to mm-hmm. that level, they're the ones that they need to thank. Uh, when I speak about my journey, I always mention Vladimir Antolich, I always mention my uh, grandmother, m- my mom, uh, people who really did shape my high school teachers, college teachers, yeah, who made it all happen. All right. Okay, so <coughs> what do you say what's, we talk? A, yeah. yeah. What, what, what's, the, what's our... Uh, uh, three hours, a little over three hours, I guess. <coughs> How many hours? Yeah, yeah. Towers and 10 minutes. Yeah, we, we still got some. It, it was more. very dense, though. Like, it does feel like we talked yeah. about a lot uh, more. Uh, please make sure the microphone is still it, it working. Does, it, it, it's, it's, it's working, right? Yeah, it it's is. working, right? It is, it is. I want to make it's sure. Mm-hmm. Except for those. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dead? Yeah, uh-huh. not right now. Uh huh. Okay. But but hang on a second. So it, was it recording when I was talking? Like, it was dead for about two, three, five minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can use that one, right? We yeah, yeah, use, yeah, we yeah, 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 we got that. Don't worry, it's still a yeah. Okay, yeah. so uh, I'm really curious what you do outside, you know, teaching the academics or running your own place. Do you have any, you know, hobbies? Yeah. You're into like sports, yeah. maybe reading, yeah. or listening to podcasts. 
So you, before the podcast, you were telling me that you you took up MMA yeah. back in university. Yeah. Do you still do it? Yeah. So what got you into MMA? I mean, um, and that's that's interesting because looking at my journey, you would probably imagine like, oh, he is a nerd, whatever. Mm-hmm. He spent his time studying. You would not imagine someone like me doing mm-hmm. MMA. But then I brought up in Samarkand where back in the day when you were young, you would go into some altercations. You would be in a position where you had to like physically mm-hmm. engage in certain fights. And uh, from the beginning of my, like I did Aikido, I did mm-hmm. a little bit of, uh, uh, actually Taekwondo, uh, Taekwondo, I did for quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, then I did MMA in Samarkand. Mm-hmm. And when I came to uh, Singapore, and it's a much safer environment, and I miss that alertness that I had. I mean, in Samarkand, when you are 18 and above, all of that ends effectively. But when you're 16, 14, 15, back in the day, for some reason, people would like challenge each other for sort mm-hmm. of some sort of uh, fights. And, and then you grow up and then it's not a problem now. But if you're like 14, 15, you would be challenged. And then when I came to Singapore in four years at Yale and US, I never saw a single person uh, physically either fight or push or whatever. Mm-hmm. Not a single, single one. And then I a little bit missed that almost primordial you know, I have this uh, saying that like, if, if you want to be a true philosopher, you need to know how to get a punch on your mm-hmm. face. Like if you want to be a true, true philosopher, not the person who's like out there and then mm-hmm. who is like taking punches. For me, that's a very important part of my philosophy is that if you have certain principles in life, any principles in life, you need to be able to get punched in the face for them. And uh, for me, MMA is all about that. It's about uh, getting punched. It's about sometimes uh, punch, punching other uh, people. Uh, I mean, not sometimes you actually, if you're, <laughs> if you're good at it. Uh, but then wrestling specifically is, uh, um, it, it's not as hard on your brain uh, cells as, uh, you know, something like boxing is mm-hmm. um, uh, because you can actually get injured from mm-hmm. that. Uh, mm-hmm. Wrestling is, is, a, is a lot more and specific type of wrestling, which is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, or even I would say I'm interested in Judo. They're more grappling heavy so you would like engage in uh in a wrestling match uh so i uh, frequently attend uh, when i have the time of course uh frequently attend a wrestling program jiu uh, jitsu program in singapore mm-hmm. and we even had a collaboration between freshman academy and ufc gym recently where we brought uh 30 to 40 of our students uh-huh. to an to an actual like wrestling session wow. uh, at the official UFC gym in Tashkent. Wow. There is an official UFC yeah, gym There is an official in UFC, Tashkent. Yes, official UFC gym in Tashkent. Wow. Yes. And so who's the founder of that place? Someone from uh, Tajikistan, very, very uh-huh. nice person. Yeah, very, very nice person. How do you know they're a nice person? You talk to them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did, we did, we did. Wow. Uh, they, they got like a, it's like a franchise kind of uh-huh. thing. Uh, and they try to grow, like, yeah. Every time I mention that, people don't mm. know that that's the case. Uh, mm-hmm. But we did a, a jiu-jitsu uh, session, wrestling session. Mm-hmm. Uh, the coach said that I should participate in local mm-hmm. competitions. Uh, maybe at some point you will see me in some wrestling competitions. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. That'd but be like so a month fun. ago or, wait, it was three months ago now. Um, I wanted to do, like I was in my room, it was after uh, admission season. I was like extremely tired, like spring basically, but I was still affected by it. And I'm like, Hey, I want to just go out there. I want to do something really fun. And, uh, yeah. And then one of my, uh, favorite, uh, jujitsu personalities or, and like, like genuinely really strong. Do you know, do you follow UFC at all? Oh, oh come on, buddy. Of course. I'm a big uh, UFC you, fan. You, you, I love UFC. Of, you do know, uh, Alex Volkanovsky. This is the guy who fought Islam Makhachev yes. from so Australia. Yes, first fight. Short guy. Yeah, yeah, the short guy who fought Islam Makhachev first fight when he was actually competitive on the wrestling side was Islam Makhachev. Mm-hmm. So uh, that person who I'm referring to, he was his head wrestling coach. Wow. So he's super popular. His name is Craig Jones. Uh-huh. 400,000, subs- like, like half a million subscribers. He's, mm-hmm. he's doing his whole thing where he starts his like wrestling mm-hmm. um, uh, what is it called, like wrestling organization, basically, mm-hmm. jiu-jitsu organization. And then he's like, hey guys, uh, I'm doing this five-day camp in Bali and uh, you have 20 minutes to sign up. Mm-hmm. And I was just sitting there in my room. I'm like, okay, Bali is like two hours from Singapore mm-hmm. on a flight. And then it was not that expensive. It was something like, 
along the lines of four to five hundred dollars, mm-hmm. which again, this kind of camp you would imagine it to be mm-hmm. like uh, a lot more. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I guess, of course, money is relative, but I thought it was not that expensive, especially mm-hmm. it's like two hours to fly there. So like, you know what? I will, I will sign up. I will go there. Mm-hmm. So I went there and then I thought, okay, there will be maybe like half of them newbies or like 30% of this newbies. Out of 90 people who were there, I was one of maybe five who were white belts. Mm-hmm. Five. There were some beasts there. There were people from Dagestan, like uh, mm-hmm. Dagestan champions. And if you're mm-hmm. a Dagestan champion, like you're basically a world champion. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there were Kazakh guys who were top level. Yeah. Uh, black belts, brown belts, whatever. And then it was like one hour session where you would learn things. And for one hour, you would just wrestle with anyone. So you could just like ask, hey, can I wrestle with you? And you could wrestle with like mm-hmm. black belt, a person who did it for 15 years or people who actually prepared for fights there, for MMA fights in that camp. It was just wild. It was, you know, Japanese, some of the toughest Japanese people, mm-hmm. some of the toughest Dagestani people, some of the toughest Norwegians. Like it was like, a, you know, in like Mortal Kombat where they bring all this like, <laughs> yeah, like, like they were scary looking people too, like scary looking, like beards or like, uh, you know, they were like bald and uh-huh. sort of must like, it was like everyone was some sort of a character there. And then in those one-on-one sparring sessions, you would go against some of the wildest guys like, and you would get broken just completely. And just like, I was like, wow, re- like wrestling, there's so much more to it. And I had that kind of realization there. I'm like, that's, that's amazing that I exposed myself to a completely new level because as a white belt, you think, oh, like it's, but then there are, there are people who do this for 15 years and still learn. Mm-hmm. And there are so many nuances there and so many cool things that I learned. So yeah. Uh, wow. uh, did, did you actually fight anyone there? Did uh, you wrestle I, with I did, anyone? I did, I did wrestle a bunch of people. Yeah. Um, and actually I realized I was not too bad, I guess mm-hmm. partly because in my family would like wrestle with my mm-hmm. dad after like dinners and stuff. Uh-huh. So I have this a little bit of intuitive and even at freshman, we had a lot of guys who were bigger than me mm-hmm. and I would wrestle some of our students and they would like go and do gyming and everything. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're like, oh, I will like, I will just completely <laughs> destroy him. But then yeah. what you realize is that if you're bigger, it means nothing mm-hmm. really. Like there were some guys there who were massive, muscly and everything. And then would go against some really technical guy from Dagestan who was, uh, normal size, regular size would go against some of the bigger size people. And then he would just completely dominate because the technique and understanding of balance and there's just so much there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, to, for me, MMA is, and specifically jujitsu and, and wrestling is, is a vent of all this intellectual work that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to use that as a place to forget about it. And uh, also it's a place where I can f- feel genuine pain which I think is very, very important mm-hmm. from a philosophical stand, standpoint. The worst thing that can happen to you is not death, actually, it's pain. Like uh, pain is the universal philosophical reference to something really, truly bad. Mm-hmm. If you die, there's this um, interesting phrase from ancient Greece. Uh, it's, um, wait, let me go something like, if you are, death is not. If death is, you are not. I mean, I, 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 yeah, yeah, we need to, you need to unpack that. Yeah, you yeah. Need so, to, so if you exist, death does not exist. If uh-huh. death exists, then you don't exist. Yeah. So there's no point where you can actually experience death mm-hmm. because when you're dead, that's it. Like mm-hmm. death completely kind of takes over you. Mm-hmm. So you don't have experience ultimately, but it's the painful death mm-hmm. that, that matters, you know, where you experience pain and pain and you can coexist in one mm-hmm. scale. Death and you mm-hmm. cannot co- coexist in one system of coordinates. Mm-hmm. It's either you exist or pain, or like that exists basically. So that was one of the attempts to solve a uh, crisis when people get older. Um, that's something that, that, that concerns people. And like, oh yeah, you know what? You should not be afraid of dying. You should be afraid of pain that might, uh, yeah, precede it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, but experiencing pain is a very, very important uh, factor. Right. Because you can just sit in your room and then you can uh, talk about all this politics and whatever, and then you're not on the front lines. You're, you're not like getting, you know, uh, and I mean, jujitsu is not really that painful, but it can get, mm-hmm. it can get painful. And sometimes it, it is painful. But to know how to get punched in the face, to be in a situation where you're struggling and just be reminded of your human limitations and the pain that you experience um, just on the physical level, 
uh, yeah, something that I find very, very important to the intellectual work that I do outside of that too. Yeah, yeah. As a knowledge worker, you do need some sort of physical exercise yeah. and just to balance things out. This is one of the reasons why I hit the gym three times a week. Mm -hmm. But these days, though, I'm mostly doing it for recovery purposes. I recently hurt myself lifting heavy. Mm -hmm. I used to do powerlifting not long ago, and then I got back hernia, so slipped the yeah, oh, disc wow. in my back. But oh, I'm almost re recovered now. Not entirely, but almost there. I mean, yeah, that's so, the price you pay sometimes. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, I just, I just know on those days when I don't feel that, you know, physical pain, like th for, that comes from lifting or pushing your body, it just things feel surreal. I feel like I'm losing touch with reality. I just need something to knock me back yeah. in that state of mind. So, and that's where exercise really comes in, right? Yeah. And you said you like you have UFC, right? Who's your favorite UFC fighter? Who's someone you're cheering for? Uh, I mean, look, uh, it's the person who you probably don't expect. And it's the person that I'm not a fan of in the sense of like, oh, mm -hmm. I know every single part of his career or anything. Mm -hmm. But the person who I respect the most is Michael Bisping. I never heard of him. Michael Bisping was this champion from UK who lost his eye mm -hmm. in one of the fights. And then you probably know Luke Rockhold. Um, so he fought some of the top people. He became a champion without an eye. And then he uh, faked having an eye by putting in like a, what, what's called a prosthesis or like whatever mm -hmm. the word is. So he put a fake eye, he duped the committee that he actually had vision mm -hmm. on his both eyes. So the way they did it, his uh, uh, trainer would like show, like they would ask him, oh, do you see mm -hmm. the numbers or whatever? And then they would tap and then show mm -hmm. how many fingers were up uh -huh. on, the, on the eye that basically was was not there uh -huh. it was just kind of a fake eye and then he never told anyone he never he just fought without an eye some of the baddest people you can imagine became a champion and then sometime after during a podcast like this he took out his fake eye oh my god <laughs> <laughs> that's like, guys, just like again that's... nonchalantly like nothing happened like he was not like fighting and then people were like wait what like of mm. course we knew his eye was a bit weird but we thought it was like mm. he he fought with a lost eye all this time i mean it's yeah, just he, he didn't just fight he won championships he won championships was like yeah. and again everyone who does mma Imagine having that side of your body, like mm -hmm. it's a blind spot, like you mm -hmm. can't see it, you see it. Mm -hmm. It's, and then, you know how people, like if anyone did it and then became a champion, maybe immediately they would say or like brag about it and be like, mm -hmm. oh, even without like with one eye, I beat you or anything. Mm -hmm. It was nothing of that. He just knew the business that he was in and just the humility and then the humbleness and the, yeah. And like mo most people don't even know about the guy and he's a, a commentator now. Mm -hmm. A family person, uh, a fighter at, at his core, a profoundly funny person and quick-witted one. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. You, you think you'll you'll ever fight in UFC? You, Me? Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> you, no I mean, UFC. that's, that's be, that, that, maybe I'll, in some uh, jujitsu competitions, absolutely. Right. But I'm at the point where I mean, look, I'm telling you, we are 25. As uh -huh. much as we think we're young, <laughs> like we, we're yeah. closer to 30. Yeah. Than we're to 20. And we need to remember that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if I go into any MMA championship, I might earn something that will like haunt me uh, in terms of injuries. Or oh whatever, yeah, yes, like, yes. For the rest of your life. Not uh, just not worth it. The risks yeah. are too too big. Yeah, not luck. I, mm -hmm. I did sport throughout my life. I did not mm -hmm. have again not luck. Uh, mm -hmm. That's by the way the knock knock thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I was telling you all about being. Mm -hmm. Scientific. <laughs> now there comes super, the most super, thing you can yeah, super session. It's, it's like you're trying to complexify the entire yeah. world into like, oh, if I do this, uh -huh. it doesn't happen, yeah. right? And it just it it it's a physical, it, it's just basically an admission that you're just a mere mm -hmm. ant in this world who is so incapable, who's mm -hmm. so powerless that you know we need those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, yeah, it's just it's, weird. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a human experience, deeply human experience. Yeah. yeah, but in any case, I mean, see, that's the thing. It's like mm -hmm. even the knock has certain meanings to it. If mm -hmm. you, uh, if you st study social sciences, yeah. Uh, a yeah. lot of things do that. 
for more regular people they just pass, pass by oh it's insignificant oh it doesn't make like make a difference but mm-hmm. it really does and it has a right. lot to say about humanity right right anyone looking for extracurriculars there you go great idea yeah yeah <laughs> study the origins of knock knock yeah, yeah. yeah that can be a research paper basically yeah. of like why people in the scientific age believe in all of those horseshoes and uh-huh. uh, even some of the best scientists i mean mm-hmm. it doesn't make, how how does it make any sense you can write a philosophy paper on that probably mm-hmm. yeah i mean it was it was one of the one of the best podcasts we've ever had i don't really know what to say but before we end this we, i know we've had a lot of philosophy here today but there's still a, couple more questions I'd like to ask you on the topic of philosophy. This is kind of a tradition we have here. Mm-hmm. So you did sort of tell us what your philosophy on life is. So would you like to sort of recapitulate that in a couple of lines or yeah. words? So what, what is your philosophy on life? Yeah. What are you trying to do, trying yeah. to do here? Uh, there was this question at International English School. Mm-hmm. And then it's a quote from a Russian movie, Brat 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the quote goes something like, what, what, uh, what holds power? What is there that holds power? Mm-hmm. And then it really made me think. And on the spot, I, I replied, it's in the freedom and responsibility. And then if you look at the freedom, that's the insight from the liberal school. Mm-hmm. The responsibility, that's conservative school. It's, uh, it's, I think it's some sort of combination between being free to do so many and take so many paths but also having that responsibility and understanding that that choice actually matters, which I think in, encapsulates both of those points of view in one. So that's the closest that I got to trying to understand what I'm doing here. It's, it's being maximizing my freedom to do MMA, to go mm-hmm. to you know, uh, all of these places, personal freedom, but also maximizing freedoms of all the people that I'm working with so that they're not just you know, they have geographic mobility, they have, they can do whatever they want in their life. But at the same time, have that responsibility to their country, to their family, to their community, which might be a little bit of a sneaky thing because I'm trying to connect two schools of thoughts that, uh, mm-hmm. of thought that many people argue are not connectable, but that's, that's my best attempt to do, to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, but so yeah, I, w- I would reply, maximizing freedom while deeply, profoundly acknowledging responsibility you have for the people around you, for your community, for the country, and uh, and have that burden. It's a, it is a burden, and yes, that's the paradoxical part where mm-hmm. it it does limit some part of your freedom. But I think that it's it's totally worth it to work in both directions, basically. Right. Yeah. Right. It's a, that's a very balanced approach, you know, to to life. It's like yin yang. You yeah. have the responsibility yeah, part yeah. is black, and the white is exactly. freedom. And that's how you balance things up. Yeah. Right. If you had a time machine and could travel back in time, what's something you would tell your younger self, your 15, 16 year old self, or all the other 15, 16 year olds out there? Mm, Just keep pushing. It's fine to Mm -hmm. feel uh, not capable. It's fine to feel deficient. It's Mm -hmm. fine to feel like you do not fit into into groups of people. Like all of that is fine. Uh, And you don't need to... um, you know, compete for the sake of competing. Uh, just do things that you that you enjoy. But again, just keep in mind uh, whatever the practical side too. Like you can't just completely disregard that. Um, I would probably say just keep doing what you're doing because mm-hmm. uh, it just in the moment it felt really hard. I felt like the dots would not connect. You just do things without really like realizing would it work out in the end. But then I would just say that, you know, it would be worth it ultimately. I don't mm-hmm. think I would tell them even if I shared all the insights that I shared with you, I don't think younger self would understand. So I would not tell any of that. I would just say, keep pushing. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, when the time comes, you will arrive with those ideas and uh, you, you'll get there. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. I want to tell you something right now. This podcast is being watched by your future self, yeah. your 30-year-old self, yeah. <laughs> looking back, reflecting, yeah. and hoping not having any cringe moments, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? What's something you would tell your 30 year old self? Um, I would say that, look, I still have energy mm-hmm. and I still have courage to speak my mind. Mm-hmm. And if you are in a position where uh, there's a lot more responsibility, where 
you know, there are some positions that you can take that are higher up there where you can't speak your mind or mm -hmm. you need to be political or diplomatic. Uh, just forgive me because <laughs> yeah, that was the <laughs> that was you at the past who was honest and who yes might have been wrong about things, but uh, he did his he did his best mm -hmm. ultimately. So so yeah, I do think that I would look back at it with uh, thinking that it was cringy, but I think that's ultimately representation of my growth. If I don't, then probably I haven't grown over that time. So hopefully I would, uh, yeah, in, in all sorts of ways. So yeah, we'll see, we'll see. Right. Yeah. Mr. Valera, I, today was, was so much fun, right? Talking to you and bouncing off ideas and, you know, sitting down here and listening to you break down how the, the mechanism of world really works. And all these new perspectives that I had no clue about, and it's such it was such an enlightening experience talking to you today. I just can't thank you enough in traveling all the way from Samarkand to be on the podcast and sharing with me, our audience, all these personal stories, insights, experience. I just, I just can't thank you enough. I mean, so, when, when we, yeah, when we prepared, I told you that I see of it as my capstone project uh -huh. right? as something that would summarize my six, eight year journey. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, because I think without you making this thing comfortable mm -hmm. and allowing me to to uh, say things that, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe at times were not the kinds of things that mm -hmm. uh, and I probably you disagreed with uh, in parts. But yeah, thank you so much for facilitating this. I don't think without you it would be possible. Uh, thanks a lot. All right, guys, if you watch today's content, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and leave thumbs up. If you have any comments you'd like to make, please leave them in the comment section below. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.